I would guess we'll do a call to order. Yeah, I think you have to open yep. up, up your public session. So. Yep, we're going to do a call to order and we'll have a moment of silence. And we'll do the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So, uh, roll call vote. Uh, yes, please. Or just roll call, please. Roll call. <laughs> Mr. Caliguire. Let's see him. Oh. Let me just come on. Ms. Dharma. Can, can you hear me, Ms. Dharma? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Mr. Dovey. Here. Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Present. Mr. Phil Jenkins. Um, Mrs. Cameron Ugian. Present. Mr. Litwack. Here. Um, Mr. McLaughlin. Here. And Mrs. Tersich Keeley. Present. Reading. Reading. Oh, my bad. <laughs> nope, you're supposed to say that. <laughs> okay. Can we please have the reading of a statement of adequate notice? Notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given as follows. Advertising in the Burlington County Times and the Carrier Post on January 14th, 2021. Post school bulletin boards and main entrance doors on February 4th, 2021. Sending a notice to the Burlington County Times and the Carrier Post on February 2nd, 2021. Filing written notice with the clerk of Delanco Township on February 2nd, 2021. And posting the notice electronically on the district website, www.delanco.com on February 2nd, 2021. Thank you. We will now open this up for the board ethics training with NJSBA representative Jesse Adams. Welcome. Hey, all right, let me unmute myself. All right, I'll... <laughs> thanks everybody for having me back. Um, what I'll do is uh, it, like, like Marissa said, this, this pretty, uh, ethics training pretty much takes the full hour and you know, you wanna try and get leave at least opportunity for questions throughout. So let me get rolling here. Uh, let me see if I have share capabilities. Nope, can uh, I ask the host to give me sharing capability? Yeah, that's uh, Jesse, that's Albert Pinero. Albert, if, if uh, you heard Jesse, if you could give him sharing, that would be awesome. Oh, there it is. Okay, let me give me uh, one second. All right, let's share. Let's go to slideshow. All right, hopefully everybody can see the opening slide ethics for school officials. Thumbs up says I'm good. All right, I'll get rolling here. Um, so let's 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 start off with a, a little bit of preliminaries. The act itself came into being back in uh, 1992. Um, and there were a lot of things that were occurring with boards in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s that, that caused public outrage. Um, and ultimately the legislators, got to, I guess, got tired of hearing from the public about school board members, superintendents, BAs, et cetera, um, um, nepotism, uh, special deals, et cetera, et cetera, uh, wasting taxpayers' funds. And they, the legislature said they could solve this and they passed this, uh, this thing called the School Ethics Act in 1992. And the bottom line is the act itself um, basically says you're the elected official. Um, you need to basically not do anything, say anything or act in any manner that may 
uh, break the public's trust or give an impression that that would break the public's trust. Um, the act also established um, some specific standards and guidelines that board members are required to follow. I like to tell um, board members all the time, both veterans, but typically, especially new board members that if you're not quite sure of what your role is or what you can and cannot do, highly recommend that you definitely understand what the code of ethics, the 10 tenets of the code of ethics are, but also the school ethics act in its entirety. And it's not that long of a read. Um, uh, if you understand the school ethics act, you understand the code of ethics and you conduct yourselves around those guidelines and, and standards, you, you, not, it's a high probability you will never get yourself in trouble. And what I mean by trouble is ending up with an audience uh, in Trenton with the School Ethics Commission. Um, that could be a very painful experience. Um, the other thing I like to point out um, to boards, I get this question a lot from board, from what I call regular boards of education. Um, I get the question, does this stuff, what, you know, does this stuff apply to charter schools and charter boards? And the answer is yes. School Ethics Act is applicable to school, uh, the, like I said, regular uh, public uh, bo um, boards of education, as well as in New Jersey, charter schools are also public boards and they call themselves trustees, which is nothing more than a fancy name for board member. But the uh, standard, the School Ethics Act, applies and there's, it spells it out specifically in the act that this uh, does apply to charter schools as well in, in New Jersey. So those trustees have to abide by the same principles that you do as, as board members. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that um, this is a, a mandatory requirement. Annually, you are required as a board to complete your annual ethics training and the acknowledgement form that you receive is what, what we call the objective evidence. All of you signing that and returning it to your BA provides her with the objective evidence that when the ECS is asking for objective evidence that you, you did your annual training, she's got all of your signatures on a document saying that you did receive that. It is also a part of CUSAC. That's why the ECS would be asking that question. As you can see in CUSAC, in the governance uh, section of CUSAC, the, in, there's 14 indicators that all belong to the Board of Education. Indicator 13, the second sentence talks about the board annually discussing the exact. Uh, it also talks about no board member having been found in violation of the act. Um, and then it also, the first sentence talks about, um, talks about the, uh, um, uh, uh, the per personal and financial disclosure statement. But um, so that's important to understand. In one of the documents that, that, that you, you were sent to you tonight, the actual 10 tenants, you'll see at the bottom of that document is in, in a box, the New Jersey code that requires you to, um, to uh, have annual training. If a board fails to have, if you fail on any of these items in this indicator, you're gonna lose eight points on CUSAC. And from a CUSAC scoring perspective, there's a hundred points. If you get less than 80, uh, basically your district in that area becomes a non high performing district and you get a bunch of help from the DOE that you don't really need or want. Um, but so eight points is a large chunk of points to lose when you can only afford to lose, you know, basically 19. <laughs> So, uh, and I always tell boards in CUSAC in the governance area, you should be 100%. There should be no reason why the Board of Education causes your district to fail or fall below 80% in that area. There are five areas and 80% in or less in any area will cause your district to be a non-high performing district, which means you, you're put on an improvement plan with the state. So, um, all right, the, the act itself established several things. The School Ethics Commission, and I'll talk about them here in a minute. The Code of Ethics, the 10 tenets that were sent to you uh, are, were established 
but they were actually established nine years after the School Ethics Act was put in place. Um, part of that is the Department of Education uh, and the State Board of Education asked New Jersey school boards to recommend what the code of ethics should be. Um, and so what we did back then, uh, we reached out to the Superintendents Association and the Business Officials Association and asked if they wanted to collaborate with us to co make, come up with the recommendation. So that, that effort resulted in 10 specific tenants uh, that were outlined as the code of ethics. It was sent to the DOE and to the state board. State board adopted it, adopted them, and they became a part of the Ethics Act. They are they're actually one paragraph in the act because there are some boards that believe if they read the 10 tenets at their reorganization and vote to adhere to the to the code of ethics, they've met the annual requirement. And that's that's a negative. They they do not meet the requirement just by reviewing the code of ethics because I believe it's it's paragraph G in the act, total act itself. There are a lot of other things in the school ethics act that you're required to be aware of. The act also is basically, if you read the act, you'll see the major premise is conflicts of interest. It looks at board members should not do anything uh, or take actions that where there is a conflict of interest. And I'll talk about that here. The, the act also established the disclosure statements that um, for the veterans, you have to do it by complete it by 30 April each year. For the new members, you have to complete it within by you know, within 30 days of being sworn in. Then once you've completed that for the first time within those 30 days, then you be, go on the annual April 30 cycle. But, but for new members, whether you're appointed or elected, from the date you're sworn in, you've got 30 days to complete your disclosure statement. And then, uh, like I said, then from that point on, your second year, your third year, you're, you're required to do it. Um, by April 30th each year. New Jersey School Boards is un covered under this act. So I have to do my disclosure by April 30th every year as well. Um, so when I left being a school board member, I thought I wasn't gonna have to do that anymore, but I kept kept right on going for the last six years. So it, it is a requirement. Training, you have mandatory training requirements. In addition to the board mandatory training that you're doing tonight, you all have individual training requirements. Um, and I'll touch on those also. Um, in fact, I'll hit on it right now. Um, mandated training. If you're a new member, you've got basically three years of mandatory training, uh, what we call governance one, governance two, governance three. In year one, you do governance one, which is new board member orientation. Um, and there's several ways that you can take your, your mandatory trainings. Um, obviously, we're not doing them in person right now. But if, when we go back to in person, you'll be able to do it in person live. Uh, we are doing live virtual trainings. And then there's also what we call the online training, which is you get if you register, if you register for that, you would get a, a, a link to go to a website and basically flip through charts uh, and take the training, you know, um, on, on you know, at, I, I, I tend to call it death by PowerPoint, but you, you take, you take, you go through it. And then at the end of that, uh, by, com by going through all those slides, you, you meet the requirement and the system records that you've done it. So there's, there's multiple ways, either virtual in person, virtual live, uh, online and at some point we'll go back to also uh, providing the training uh, in an in-person mode. But for your for new board members first year, new board member orientation, there are several things that are required in law for new board members to be trained in. Uh, and so new board member orientation covers those things. For example, New Jersey Q QSAC, the Quality Single Accountability Continuum, which is the monitoring system of the state for, for, for school districts. You need to be, you're required to be trained in that. that. That does occur in new board member orientation. You're also required within the first six months to have been trained on the superintendent evaluation. Um, so that is also done in new board member orientation. So, uh, so that we ensure that new board members 
Uh, and one other thing, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. You're required to have that uh, at least once in your t tenure as a board member. So those three items for new board members get covered in new board member orientation. So you've all those legal requirements are taken care of. In your second year, uh, we, you're required to take uh, governance two, which is school finance. And then in your third year, you're required to take governance three, which is focused on student achievement. So those are your first three years as a board member. That's your, your mandatory training requirements. They are what I call one and done. Every board member is required in their first three years to take them. Once you've taken all three of them, you'll never have to take those three training programs again. And what I mean by that is you're, you live in Delanco and you know, you get through your three years of, of training, or let's say you get through uh, governance one and governance two, and then you, you move to another town. So you have to leave the board. After living in that town for a while, you decide to run for the board and you get elected. Well, you, just because you're a new board member in that town doesn't mean you start over at governance one. Your record is, is alive as long as, you, you, you're, as, you, as you're in the state of New Jersey. So the records will show you've already taken one and two, you know, in your first year as a board member on this new board, you have to finish governance three to get that out of the way. So, like I said, it's a one and done for um, reelected board members. Once you've gone through your first, first term and you're reelected to a new three-year term, you're in your first year of your new term, you're required to take governance four which is a legal update. Uh, and so that's a requirement. So every reelected member, first year of their reelected term, they have a mandatory uh, requirement as well. So those are the mandatory training requirements. Uh, and it's important and you, you'll see in a later slide, you got basically, for lack of a you know, better, better statement, you got 365 days to get your training done. You know, you gotta get done by December 31st each year. Um, and there's no, there's really no reason why you shouldn't get it done, you know, within the, within the year that you've gotten it. Um, but, but the SEC does monitor that. In fact, New Jersey School Board in the statute is the training organization for mandatory training. And we also are required to monitor it. And, you know, we're, we're in February now and we're getting ready. We've just completed what we typically do in January and we, we identify who hasn't completed, who didn't complete their training by December 31st. And we kind of send them emails to say, hey, you need to go in and get it done because the SEC would rather you get it done than to have to deal with you. But by the end of January, we cry uncle and we say, all right, you've, got, you've had your chance. We, we officially are required to send a list. Our general counsel reviews the list and then sends it to the SEC. And then they take it from there. And I'll talk about some of the things they do. Um, the commission itself, the SEC, I've been talking about them, nine member commission appointed by the governor. Uh, each member is uh, uh, appointed for a three-year term. Um, basically the law reads they're appointed for a three-year term or until the, the, uh, the governor replaces them. So if their term expires, you know, they serve three years, their term expires, uh, unless they really need to leave, uh, want to get off, they continue serving until the governor appoints, either reappoints them or appoints somebody new to take their seat. So sometimes you'll look at the website for the SEC and you'll see that the, you know, someone's on there with an expiration date. <laughs> their term has already expired. Why are they still there? That's why they haven't been replaced yet and they're agreeing to continue to serve because they want to stay there. So odds are at some point the governor will reappoint that person. Um, but that's that's the deal there. Here, the breakdown, two school board members, two school administrators, and then five non-school officials. Um, and no more than the law states, no more than five can be from one political party because a board of education is not a political body. Uh, it's an apolitical body. There are no Democrats, Republicans, independents, Green Party, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a non-political board. And the idea is that the commission should not be skewed any one way from a, from a political standpoint. It should stay apolitical as well. Um, 
the SEC is very powerful. They've got a lot of responsibilities. Um, I, I'm just going to mention because I'm sharing my screen, I see folks that are in the waiting room. So I, I'm assuming somebody else is taking care of those when they pop up. Um, uh, SEC, uh, like I said, has a lot of power. A couple, two of their main uh, responsibilities are advisory opinions and ethics complaints. I tell board members to think of that in terms of advisory opinion before someone commits a violation. Ethics complaints, after a violation has been, uh, someone perceives a violation has been committed. Um, an advisory opinion is, let, let, let me give you a scenario. Jesse Adams, board member, uh, is thinking about taking an action or doing something, but I'm not quite sure if what I'm going to do may cross the line and cause me a problem with the School Ethics Act. So I need to get an opinion. Your first opinion should be your board attorney. That's what you're paying them for. Um, and every board has a process for how you can talk to the board attorney. Um, there's, there's, and you all should know what that process is because all of you cannot just pick up the phone and call the board attorney. Um, there, you know, that's, it's a statutory requirement that every board has a process. Typically the process that I've seen in the 22 years when I was a board member, as well as the six years being a field rep, is most boards have a, a policy that states the superintendent, the BA, and the board president have authorization authority to speak to, and reach out to the board attorney to discuss uh, board business, a uh, board and district business. Um, other members who have a, have a need to speak to the attorney have to get permission. And typically that's through the board president. Um, so what that means is the board, you need to let the board president know if that's the process you have in your district, know why you need to speak to the attorney and the board, be, and the board president needs to make a decision on whether to allow that. Once that decision is made to allow you to contact the attorney, they, what typically happens is the board president will contact the BA to let the BA know because what happens when you call or talk to the attorney? They hit this little button, this timer that keeps track of the minutes they talk to you, and then there's a bill that comes to the BA. So the reason the BA, the board attorney, I mean the board president would contact the BA is to let them know that I gave Jesse permission to call the attorney. So if you get a bill that says you know, discussions with Jesse, that's a legitimate bill that should be paid. So that's part of that. Uh, responsibility of making sure. And the reason there is a process required in every district is because you're obligating taxpayer funds. That phone call, that conversation is obligating taxpayers funds and that needs to be controlled. And so that that's why it's required that every district have a process on who can call the attorney to obligate taxpayer dollars. All right, so that's, a, so uh, you would get your permission and uh, your attorney would give you an opinion of what, whatever the action is you're thinking about. And, I, and so I asked for that opinion. I'm not happy with the board attorney's opinion. I may not agree with it. I want a second opinion. Where do I go? The SEC is where you would go. You can request an advisory opinion. And on the SEC website, on the DOE website, in the SEC section, there are instructions on how to request uh, to submit an advisory Requ uh, opinion request. There's also instructions on how to file a, an ethics complaint, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But you would put the facts of the situation that you're con contemplating and you would send it to the SEC. They meet every month and typically within a 45 day window, depending on when that meeting is, you'll get a response back from them uh, telling that you what they think of this situation. Um, it is a confidential correspondence between you and the SEC. You can share it, but, but it is deemed to be confidential uh, from that perspective. But you, you, know, you have the ability to share with your board if you, if you wanted to, uh, because there may have been a question about something that you were doing or, or thinking about doing. Um, but, um, but the commission by law has the ability to look at a, an advisory uh, uh, opinion request and say, you know what, based on the facts here, if any 
school official did this in the state of New Jersey, it would be a problem, not just this one board member. And this is something that all board members should know about. They can take a vote. And if six members of the SEC agree, that advisory opinion becomes a public advisory opinion. Now, I just said it was a confidential communication. Well, if you go and read the public advisory opinions, you can't tell who the board member was. You can't tell what district it came from. It's basically sanitized. You see the facts and the opinion that the SEC has given. Now, the important thing to understand is that the School Ethics Act is law, and there's things that you should not be violating. Advisory opinions, you can basically look at those as addendums to the law. Every public advisory opinion is basically law now. And when it, once, it's it, once it's issued, if you do something that you're not supposed to do per that advisory opinion, you've violated the School Ethics Act. So it's important that you know what those advisory opinions are. Um, and, and because the minute they hit, there is a website on the SEC uh, website of public advisory opinions. The minute they post that to that website, we are all accountable to that advisory opinion. So that's what an advisory opinion is. Now you have an ethics complaint. And what an ethics complaint is, is someone in the state of New Jersey believes that a school official violated the School Ethics Act. And I said in the state of New Jersey because there are board members who believe that the only people who can file an ethics complaint against them is someone from their town, the people who elected them. And that's not true. I, you know, I'm living here with you guys in Burlington County. And if I know of a, I have the facts of a, of a situation that I, that I know of uh, for a school official in uh, Bergen County, I can, I can file an ethics complaint against that person. It's anyone living in the state of New Jersey can file an ethics complaint if they believe a school official has violated the act. When I say school official, the definition of school official is board members, superintendents, business administrators, and other administrative personnel who have financial responsibilities. They can obligate funds, they can obligate, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, enter into purchase agreements, et cetera. So depending on their, their financial role in the district, you know, what, what permissions the BA has given them, um, they fall under this act as well. So that's what a school official is, all right? Um, so if uh, an ethics complaint is filed against a, a member, the member gets notified and then there's a process that, that goes through and I'm not gonna run through that process in, in the interest of time. Um, if, if, you, if you ever really wanna know the full process, give me a holler. Um, but it's, like I said, it's a process you really don't wanna hopefully ever get involved in. But if, if a, um, someone files an ethics complaint, the, uh, commission, you know, the uh, SEC contacts the member, says you had a complaint filed against you, you get a chance to tell your side of the story. They take a look at it. If they don't dismiss it and determine that it's, it warrants further review, they then take it to a hearing. So if it goes through that hearing process, which is the beginning of a legal process, um, it goes through the hearing process and the SEC finds that there was a violation of the act. The SEC can make one of four recommendations to the commissioner of education uh, on a penalty. And, he, and these are the four on the chart. The first one is a reprimand. A reprimand, I call that the slap on the wrist. The, uh, super, the commissioner will send the member a letter stating that you violated the act, identify what what sections, paragraphs, tenets, whatever that you violate and basically tell you, you, you need to never do that again. Um, the, the next level is a censor. Uh, that's the reprimand on steroids. The censor, uh, if, if, if the commissioner issues a censor, the censor basically means there is a formal notification or a pub, pub, publication of your act. What happens is the state board passes a resolution that basically Im immortalizes in the state of New Jersey forever in the records that you violated the act. So your name is put into the minutes of the record that Jesse Adams 
violated this act, these tenets, and was issued a censor by the Commissioner of Education, da, 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 da. In parallel, the local board that the member sits on is also required to pass a resolution, a local resolution, basically stating the same thing so that in the minutes of your local board minutes and in your town, you are immortalized in your town as having violated the act. So that's what a censor uh, results in. SEC can uh, recommend a suspension for any link that they think is appropriate and the SEC can recommend removal from your board. SEC makes recommendations. The commissioner has the final decision. He can either keep it, he or she can either keep it, reduce it, or increase the penalty. Commissioner has the final say. If a member is found guilty and, and the commissioner issues a penalty and they want to appeal, their appeal is to the appellate court division. That's why I said, once you go into the hearing process, you are now starting a legal process because your appeal rights are at the appellate court level. So, so that's what happens with ethics complaints. Just to give you a feel for what, what occurred in 2020 last year, um, the SEC uh, had 21 advisory opinions sent to them. Of the 21, advised opinions that they reviewed, only one received six votes that said they should make it a public advisory. And I'll on the next chart, I'll touch on that so you understand what that was that, 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 that was uh, made public as a public advisory. Mandatory training, I talked about a little early about mandatory training. Like I said, we said we're in the process of sending the 2020 list. This is based on those who didn't Finish their training by December 31, 2019. So based on the list that was sent to them, there were 22 cases, uh, board members, individuals who had not completed their training. Of those 22, eight members were removed from their boards. Four of them received 30-day suspensions from their boards, and the other 10 received reprimands. Now, I didn't, I haven't dug into who those eight removals were, but I can almost bet that those eight people that got removed were repeat offenders. You know, they, they were frequent flyers, so to speak, right? They had been warned before, they did it again, and the board and the SEC said bye-bye, and they recommended removal and the commissioner removed them. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, suspensions are probably someone who might've missed one in the past as well, but they're giving them another chance, basically with the suspension, uh, reprimands, obviously you, you, you did it. It's probably your first time, don't do it again. So uh, that, that's what happened in the mandatory training arena. That's why I tell folks, you got 365, don't wait till the last minute. And I will tell you all, don't wait until the, when school's close for the holidays uh, in Christmas time between Christmas and New Year's to wait to do it um, because I've gotten, Two, two different years since I've been a field rep, December 31st, New Year's Eve, board member calling me in a panic because they didn't complete their training and they can't get into the system. They're trying to do the online version and they can't get in. And I'm like, they need IT help. Well, guess what? I, you know, our Christmas, that, that Christmas period is usually a downtime and our IT guys like to take their vacation during that time. So, uh, don't wait until that time to try and get your mandatory training done. From a school ethics violations, there were 20, 28 ethics complaints filed last year. 24 of them were dismissed, didn't go to a hearing, but ended up, you know, initially were deemed not appropriate and were dismissed. But four cases were recommended, went through a hearing and recommended to the commissioner. And I'll touch on those here in a little bit. Advisory opinion, the one advisory opinion last year, Get, was uh, stemmed around a relative of a superintendent. And in this case, superintendent's sister-in-law, his brother's wife, was a lunch aide in the district and was hired in the district before the superintendent became superintendent of the district. That person was selected as a finalist for a secretarial position. So she applied for a new role, uh, was selected as a finalist. Superintendent asked the SEC if it was fair to prohibit a qualified and vetted employee 
to move into another role only because her brother-in-law is the superintendent. SEC reviewed that and said, basically, no, you can't, that person can't be a finalist. SEC advised that if the superintendent recommended his sister-in-law for a promotion, he would violate the act. The public would reasonably perceive this action was securing an unwarranted privilege, advantage or employment for a relative, an other type relative, and could leave and would leave a justifiable impression that the public trust was being violated. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but bottom line, superintendent, based on the nepotism law, can't recommend any of his relatives for hire or a board member's relative for hire in the district. So all recommendations for personnel have to come from the superintendent. So in this case, the superintendent would be recommending his sister-in-law to the board for the secretarial position. The SEC said, no, that can't happen. Um, the SEC also pointed out that the superintendent must recuse himself from all, any and all discussions on the sister-in-law's employment as a lunch aide in the district. So his, the lunch aide basically isn't going to be able to move it to any other position in the district uh, other than being a lunch aide. So um, relatives do end up, you know, they can stay employed when a board member comes on the board or a superintendent becomes superintendent, as long as they're hired prior to that, they can stay employed, but obviously their ability to grow potentially is going to be limited. That, that was the advice, one advisory opinion that was issued last year. So I'm gonna take you through several charts. I'm gonna move through these very quickly, but these are based on the 10 tenant. These are the 10 tenants. What, and you'll get a copy of PDF version of this handout of this uh, PowerPoint after, after we go down, I'll send it to your BA and she'll get it to you. Um, so when you refer back to it, what you'll see here is the gray box is the, the actual uh, tenant and the standards listed below are what I call food for thought, things that we've put into this slide to help you think about what potentially could be a violation of the, uh, the tenant itself. So that's when you read those, that think in terms of these are the kind of things I should or should not do as it relates to this, uh, this tenant. The first tenant is pretty simple and basic. You're the elected officials. You have to obey and adhere to and enforce the laws of the, of the land, of the state, of the state board, of the re all the regulations, court orders, et cetera, whether you like them or not. So that's, that's a requirement, plain and simple. Tenant B, this is why you're a board member. Uh, I tell boards all the time, it's not about the adults, it's about the children. And in the, in the School Ethics Act, specifically in the Code of Ethics, Tenant B specifically points to your responsibility as a board member. It's not to the taxpayers, it's not to the adults, it's to the students. Every child in your district, you're responsible for establishing the educational welfare of all children in your district regardless of ability, race, creed, sex, social standing. This is what it's all about. So if you're, if you think, if you came onto the board saying, I got to, I'm going, my goal is to reduce taxes, you're violating the School Ethics Act because that's not your role. Now, yes, you need to be able to provide for the educational welfare within the finances that the public and the state give you, but your job is not to be, your number one focus is not, I want to take 10% out of the budget without understanding the ramifications to what you're doing to the educational welfare of the student. But you need to, so that's, that's an important piece that you should understand. Tenant C, you have, the board has four main functions. And when we do foundations of board governance, roles and responsibilities, we talk about the four functions of a board. Three of them are right here in the code of ethics. Tenant C, policy making, planning and appraisal. You're a policy making body, that's how you tell the district what you do, what you want as a board. You're, you, have a, the, you have planning responsibilities, district goals, strategic planning, the budget process. Yeah, that's your part of your responsibilities from a planning perspective. You don't create the budget. You don't physically develop the budget, but the planning process that goes into getting that budget to the end is part of your planning responsibilities. And you have appraisal responsibility, oversight and appraisal. Is the district being well run? You have that responsibility, but you also have performance appraisal responsibility for one individual. Your superintendent 
is responsible for everyone, every, all other employees in the district, but you have responsibility for the performance appraisal annually of the superintendent, which is required to be done by 31, uh, um, 30, by one July each year. Uh, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You'll also lose, lose CUSAC points if you don't do it by that deadline date. So that's what this talks about. Um, Tenant D talks about your responsibility and, and, I, and it's, it's an oversight role, not an administration role. This says you are not administering the school and you will carry out your responsibilities with your fellow board members to see that the district is being well run. You don't run the district. You ensure that it's being well run. You hire your superintendent to run the district. That's, so that's part of that. You should not be administering, micromanaging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's important to understand that, um, you know, uh, I, I like to use an example. If there's a, uh, a budget item, $50,000 for carpeting in a new wing, as a board member, if you ask the question at the board table, um, well, you know, what kind of, you know, is it going to be pile? Is it going to be Berber? What color is it? You're out of your swim lane. That's administering it. You don't have that responsibility to pick the colors and the quality, et cetera, et cetera. You're, as a board member, you're, the right question is 50,000 seems a lot. Did we budget for that? You know, is it part of our capital plan? Those are board member oversight responsibility kind of questions that are appropriate so that your BA or your superintendent would say, yes, it's part of our capital plan. We were going to do the A wing this year. We budgeted for it. And we'll be in next year's budget. We're probably going to have another 50 to get the B wing. To, so that's the, did, did we provide the resources? That's your question. Not, you know, what kind of carpet is it? Or, you know, can we, can we decide we don't like, want to do the A wing. We're going to pick other classrooms. That's not your responsibility. So that's, that's kind of an oversimplified example of the difference between administering and your oversight responsibility. Um, this one talks about your authority. Board members, when, when Marissa taps the gavel at the end of the night to adjourn the meeting, you, your authority as individual board members is no different than anybody out in the public, all right? You have authority as a board. The board speaks as a board. All the decisions that are made are as a board. An individual board member has zero authority away from the board table. Um, now, we all know you walk around town with that big scarlet B on your forehead, and everybody knows you're a board member, and they come to you to solve problems. You can't. It's against the law, and in the, actually the last tenant, when I get to it, will explain that you are not problem solvers for your community. You, your job is to help them understand how to use the chain of command. Um, so it's important to understand that authority rests with the board and you should not make any personal promises or take any private action that could compromise the board. So go, telling somebody out there, they, could, they could bring a complaint to you and say, hey, you know what? I understand your problem. I guarantee I, I'll take care of it. I'll look into it and I'll solve this. It'll never happen again. That's making a promise, personal promise. It's taking private action. And if somebody, and if you did that action and someone filed a complaint, guarantee you, you would be found guilty by the SEC. And depending on what that action was, could it get you removed from your board? So it's something that you need to understand that you, your responsibility is to push everything back to the administration help them understand the chain of command, understand the complaint policy that you have established so that those you can explain that to members, to uh, stakeholders and constituents. So it's important to understand that away from the table, you have zero authority. Don't do something that's going to get yourself in trouble by making a promise or doing something, uh, taking in that private action that's going to get you, get you in front of the SEC. Independent judgment. You're... One of the things this tenant says is that you should not be surrendering your independent judgment to any partisan group or special interest group. You might have been elected by a group of folks you know, who pushed you in your section of town because they, we need to get somebody on the board because our issues aren't getting addressed. 
They help you within a campaign, they get you elected, and now you're on the board and they say, all right, our concerns are going to get addressed. Well, guess what? It's not that easy, right? And the bottom line is I go back to tenant B, which says, why are you there? You're there for the children, not for the adults. So they might have had a bunch of complaints and issues that they want you to address, but you may not be able to address any of them because they're not relating to the educational welfare of the children. So, so it's, uh, it's important to understand your allegiance is to the district, to the, to the children, and to the Board of Education. That's what you signed up for, whether you knew that or not. Tenant G, two-part two tenant. One, confidentiality. Pretty simple. You are privy to a lot of confidential information. The bottom line is you do not, you should not be um, divulging confidential information ever. What's in executive session stays in executive session until that item moves to the public agenda for action. So if it never comes out of executive session, it forever stays confidential and you need to keep it that way. And that's, you can't talk to anybody. I, I was a board member for 22 years. My wife worked in the board office. And so she knew some of the hot items that were going on. And I'd come home after a meeting and she, she knew that this was probably something that was going to be talked about in the executive. Hey, can you tell me what happened? Good night, dear. You know, <laughs> those are the standard conversations. You cannot divulge this stuff. The second half is two-way communication. That's the fourth function of a board. You're responsible for ensuring that your district is communicating out, outward. And then as you hear hopefully good things, not just bad things, but as you hear the of the aspirations of your community, you as a board member should be bringing that to your fellow board members and to your superintendent so that you hopefully as a group are always working to meet the needs of the community for the good of the children. So uh, tenant H, appoint the best qualified personnel available after consideration of the recommendation of the superintendent. You can't do anything in personnel hire, fire, transfer, anything, you know, give raises, whatever, without the recommendation of the superintendent. But once you have the recommendation, you have to then make an informed vote. You know, I get asked the question, well, Don, once we have the recommendation, aren't we required to say yes? The answer is no, you're not required. You're required to make an informed vote. But if you are going to say no for, you should have a good reason that you've done your homework. Um, and no, you know, you're not required to tell what your reason is, but it should not be for any anything that's arbitrary or malicious or capricious. Okay, so you should make an informed decision based on the facts. And I, this is important. Um, you should a board member should never be heard in public at any time saying anything negative by, uh, by about any staff member. That's including the superintendent, right? Because this, by this tenant, your responsibility is to support and protect the staff in the proper performance of their duties. If you as a board member have a concern about a staff member, the appropriate thing to do is the chain of command. For the Board of Education, your chain of command is a one-stop shop. It starts and stops with the superintendent. Bring your concern to the superintendent Superintendent is the personnel manager for the district. So he has that personnel management responsibility. So bring your concern, you've given that concern and you move away, right? You're done, you've given the concern. You should not expect the superintendent to get back to you with what, what he found, what he did, if there was discipline, et cetera. That's none of your business, that's out of your swim lane. So it's part of administration, administering You've done your job to raise the concern, present the concern. Now it's up to the superintendent to do what he thinks is appropriate. And that's his call at that point. So it's important to understand you should always be supporting and promoting your staff. Tenant J, this is, this is a biggie. I will refer all complaints to the chief administrative officer, i.e. the superintendent, and will act on the complaints at public meetings only after failure of an administrative solution. Now, what does that term mean? Failure of an administrative solution sounds pretty negative. What it means is an individual followed the chain of command, which starts at the bottom, right? You know, typically a teacher um, followed 
addressed their concern, up the chain of command, wasn't happy with the first response, made an appointment with the assistant principal. Wasn't happy with that response, made an appointment with the friends and worked their way up the chain of command to the superintendent. Addressed their concern with the superintendent, superintendent made a decision and the person wasn't happy with the superintendent's decision. That's, the, that's what's meant by failure of an administrative solution. The person followed the chain of command and was not able to get it resolved through the administrative chain of command. So now per, and it should be per your policy as well, the, the board member, I mean, the person now has an opportunity to request the superintendent, to tell to say to the superintendent, I request a hearing before the board to address my issue. I'm not happy with what you did or what, your, what you've done. And I would like to discuss this with the board. Superintendent would then bring it to the board, inform you that a member of the public has asked for a hearing of the board, uh, would inform the attorney, because we typically say you should let your attorney handle this because that hearing, Someone says something wrong, you could be in litigation. Um, so, um, but the uh, superintendent would brief you on what the issue is, what the, the decisions were made, and the person's not happy. And then you would schedule a hearing. And now, per this tenant, you now have the ability as the board to hear the complaint. Um, typically, we let I, I, my recommendation is always let the uh, attorney do the questioning and answering. Um, if there's a need to caucus, because maybe another question popped into a board member's head, ask the person to step out, the, the constituent to step out, caucus, come bring the person back in, ask the additional questions. If the person doesn't have anything else, the attorney says, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming in. The board will deliberate your concern and the superintendent will contact you in 24 hours with the board's decision. And then you, you deliberate and make a decision on whether you want to do something different than what the superintendent has, is, has done or you uphold what the superintendent has done. That's that, and so that's the time you have a, a chance to have a say in a complaint. But we also tell you, be careful if you're getting complaints and you go to hearings and you're routinely overturning the superintendent, that's not necessarily a good thing either. So um, that's the 10 tenets. Um, it's important to understand that, um, that, that this one will get you in big trouble if you try to solve problems and complaints out there. It's important to understand boards tend, sometimes get themselves in trouble during public comment of their meeting because someone comes to, to public comment with a concern or a complaint and they're looking for the board to solve it. And the superintendent has, it hasn't even brought, been brought to anybody in the chain of command yet and the board tries to solve that problem. By this tenant, you're not allowed to. And so what we tell board presidents routinely is public comment is the public's opportunity to comment. It's not public dialogue. You manage that as a board. Um, simple questions like, you know, hey, you know, when, when, when something gonna, is gonna show up on the school calendar, that's something probably the superintendent can very easily answer. But if there's a concern or a complaint that they want addressed, the appropriate response is, thank you for bringing your concern to us. We've heard you. Um, could you please make an appointment with the superintendent tomorrow so that he can further look into this? And that's it. You should not get into a debate as a board trying to solve this person's problem. Because of this tenant, you will be you're basically breaking the law by trying to do that, All right? So um, I know we're coming up on the seven o'clock, so I'm just gonna flip through some things relatively quickly here. These are some of the SEC cases that, uh, that I talked about last year. Board member employed as a teacher in another school district failed to disclose income received as president of that district's education association. So they were teaching in another district. They're on a board in their hometown. They're the board, they're the union president and they get a stipend. They, they didn't claim it on their financial disclosure. This person was found in violation, received a censor. Um, this next one teacher, parent sent an email to the full board about the superintendent's handling of an incident. A board member intending to email the board used reply all. So the parent teacher also received the email that included details of the board's executive session discussion on of the incident. In this case, the uh, SEC found that the board member violated confidentiality. 
also said that there was a potential Open Public Meetings Act violation. By replying all, you're having a full board discussion. So that if someone were to take that situation and report it to the state, you could be in litigation for an Open Public Meetings Act violation, which would cost, and if you lose, you're gonna be using taxpayer dollars to pay those fines. So this person uh, received, uh, rec the recommendation was a reprimand. The commissioner's final decision still hasn't been published, but, that, but that's, that's what uh, the SEC has recommended, a reprimand. The next one, this is a social media one. Um, a board member posted content on a blog that contained deliberate, repeated, and unnecessary, unnecessary attacks of the qualification, salary, and general employment of a tenured teacher in the district. Uh, and this, what, basically, what what happened here was the the uh, the uh, the um, member at the hearing claimed that he was exercising his First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, and all that good stuff. Also said that he put the disclaimer that he wasn't speaking for the board, which is one of those requirements. Um, but throughout the uh, the blog, he he made re continual mention that he was a board member. So the SEC said, "Nah, not convincing that you weren't speak, you know, using your position as a board member to make these these statements that you were making." This board member received a six month suspension. Um, uh, for for that social media, so it becomes and this is this is a good one from the perspective of what we get a lot of questions about social media. Um, we tell board members stay away from it um, because it's going to get you in trouble um, because those those can be viewed as private action that you're taking, stating things that you may should may not be should not be stating, and even if you say I'm not speaking on behalf of a board, the people that are looking at you typically know you're a board member. So you potentially risk yourself saying something that's viewed as, oh, this person's a board member, so this must be true, um, and getting yourselves in trouble. So it's important to understand social media is, is getting more and more attention, and we're starting to see more and more complaints starting to get filed for people who violate, who do things on social media that others believe might be a violation of the act. Um, in this one, uh, the superintendent revoked a send receive relationship with an out of state district that a board had for some children that they were said they were receiving services with and said that there are there are in state school, schools that can do this and uh, basically told the district to pick one of the in state schools to get the services from. This impacted the board president's child, who was, I guess, one of those children receiving those services. The board president fully participated in actions that resulted in the passing of a board resolution to continue the relationship with the out-of-state school with tuition to be paid by the district. This was a blatant disregard for the commissioner's decision and obviously a conflict of interest. And so this person ended up only receiving a censor, um, but that was because by the time this got to the SEC, the person, re, uh, the board president resigned from the board um, so the highest penalty that they could have given was a censor, but they, if the person was still a board member, the SEC said that they would have recommended removal of this person from the board. Um, and then the last one here, um, a member, a board member attended an all expenses paid conference offered by a potential vendor that the member had introduced to the district based on a pre-existing uh, relationship. The SEC found that this was a violation, issued a six month suspension. Basically, this person was using his position, got a good deal, uh, free trip. There was no reason for a free trip. Um, the one thing that was pointed out that is that the, the uh, SEC had recommended removal of the board member. The commissioner reduced it to a six month suspension. The SEC's rationale is they wanted a removal to send a message to all board members that you should not be entertaining, and school officials, that you should not be entertaining accepting any types of gifts. Um, and for whatever reason, the commissioner amended it to a six month suspension. The member did appeal and it is in going through the appeal process, but is, is currently serving that six month suspension. So, um, I'm going to move on here. Conflicts of interest. The act talks about conflicts of interest. You all need to be aware. These are the kind of things that when you're looking at your agenda, 
and going to take action or you're going to do something as a board member that you think might cross any of these areas, you need to ask yourself, do I have a conflict or a potential conflict? Or could the public perceive that there's a conflict here? And you may need to ask your board attorney, should I abstain? Should I recuse myself from the discussions? Um, what we tell board members, when in doubt, step out. Basically step away from that conversation, step away from that vote, recuse yourself, don't abstain from the vote um, so that you don't potentially cause yourself a conflict that get, might get you written up. Nepotism law, basically, basically these, these folks on your side plus your, um, your significant other side can call, potentially cause you a conflict as it relates to um, your role as a board member for conflicts. So you just need to be aware of this. Um, I touched on this superintendent based on the nepotism law cannot hire or recommend the hiring of a relative or of himself or herself or of a board member. And if you do have relatives in the district, you have restrictions as it relates to the folks that are in the chain of command of that relative, as which obviously the top of that chain of command is the superintendent. So anybody with relatives in the district, you're conflicted. You can't be involved in anything relating to the personnel activities of the superintendent and those in the chain of command. Um, collective bargaining, if you have relatives in education or you're in education, you have some restrictions as it relates to collective bargaining within your district. Advisory opinion A2417 has a table. This is just an excerpt from that, but it gives you a pretty good detailed table. If you have relatives in the district, um, you should look at that table to see what category you fall in to get guidance on whether you can or cannot participate in the collective bargaining process in your district. Um, uh, I don't believe you have uh, any need for the doctrine of necessity, but the bottom line doctrine of necessity means if a, if a board has so many conflicted board members that they can't take a legally required vote. There are certain votes by statute require a certain number of the full membership of the board for it to pass. Personnel items typically require majority of, if you're a nine member board, it requires the majority of a nine member board to pass. So if six people show up, uh, you know, if, if, if six people show up at a board meeting and a vote on a personnel item yields four yeses, two noes, that item fails because it needs, it needs a majority of nine, even though nine didn't show up for the meeting. So that any, there are several votes in statute that require that kind of uh, response. If you have conf conflicted members that will not allow you to have that kind of a vote, you invoke the doctrine of necessity, there's a process, then those conflicted members are allowed to vote on that one issue. Uh, volunteerism, um, the advisory opinions over the last five years have impacted the kind of things that board members can volunteer for in their district. And, and it can be confusing, but what this next chart, and you'll get, as I said, you'll get this. What our legal department did was they developed this, I call it uh, the, uh, a, a volunteer checklist. There are seven questions here with seven answers on the screen. You'll see in green, no, no, et cetera. These seven questions, if you're gonna volunteer for an activity in your district, and usually board members who come on are, have, are active volunteers, that's why they got involved and ultimately ended up becoming school board members. There's, there may be some things you can no longer volunteer for. What, what we tell you to do is look at your activity, ask yourself these seven questions as it relates to that activity. If you get the same answers that are listed on this, on this chart, then you're, you're pretty, you know, almost 100%, you're okay, and you can volunteer that to do that and that activity. But if you get a different answer than, he, than is here, then you probably need to talk to your board attorney uh, because you're probably not able to continue doing that volunteer activity. So this is hopefully a handy dandy, easy way to help you uh, work through the volunteer screen. Interviews. Board members are not involved in the interview process. That's, that, that's a definite, SEC frowns on it. 
Uh, there is one exception that the SEC has made, and that's for what, what, we, what are called administrative staff positions. And I say senior administrators, like, for example, if you, uh, if you had an assistant superintendent and that person retired or left and you were going to hire another assistant superintendent, that's a position that the board can participate in. Um, up to two board members can be participate in that, that process. And only if the superintendent invites the board to participate. If the board, if the superintendent doesn't want the board involved in any of those uh, positions like the BA or a superintendent uh, interview process, that's the, that's, that's the uh, superintendent's prerogative and there's nothing a board can do about it. So, but, but if the board superintendent wants inclusion, up to two can, but you have to follow the rules and, and, and process that the superintendent has put in place. You can't go rogue. Exit interviews. Person leaves the district, typically superintendent, principals, they have exit interviews. Board members are never allowed to be a part of exit interviews or to hear what comes out of exit interviews. Um, and to wrap it up, a couple of things. This is the time of year that we tell recommend uh, board members take an inventory of your relatives uh, in the state of New Jersey that are in education or potentially in the district. So you have that. Also take a, an interview, uh, a, uh, an inventory of your volunteer work and in the district that, that you typically do. We recommend you give that to your board attorney and ask for an opinion. What, what I used to do was our board, we used to get all that, collect all that, the board attorney would review it and tell us, tell each board member whether, whether they were conflict conflicted and for what they were conflicted in. So we all knew what the landmines were. And so we made sure we worked as a team not to step on, make sure that folks didn't step on those landmines. So we would, we would stay out of trouble. Also, I talked about advisory opinions being made public and that you're accountable the minute they're released. Our legal department, every um, SEC meeting, one of our lawyers attends those meetings to hear what's going on. And if an advisory opinion is made public, the next school board notes, they do an article, advisory opinion update to let the membership know, hey, something has happened. You need to be aware of this. So I would rec highly recommend, you know, you get a lot of stuff from New Jersey uh, school boards in your email. And I've had people tell me it's too much. I, can't, I don't have time to read it, so I dump it. School board notes, at least open it up, look at the table of contents. And if you see advisory update, at least read that article because there's something legal that you need to know about. And then if you want to dump it after that, fine. I would recommend you read the whole thing because there's a lot of good information in it. But um, that's kind of how we try to make sure folks know something's out there that you need to be aware of so you're not blindsided. Um, and you know, the bottom line is the act is put in place so that hopefully no one no board or in board individual board members and school officials ever do anything that will violate the act and break the public's trust. So with that, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, uh, when you do get the PDF version, you'll see this last page has a bunch of links. These are the actual cases that I pointed out in the uh, thing. So if you wanted to read the full case, you could. Also, there's a link to where the advisor, public advisories are. So you, so you can go see what kind of advisory opinions are out there. Um, and so, and like I said, this is public information for you, but I give you these references so that you can, you know, on, in the PDF document, to, you know, in your Adobe reader, you, when you scroll over it, the link is there, you can click on it and it'll take you to the SEC website. Uh, so with that, that's it. I'll stop sharing, uh, answer any, Final questions that folks may have. So, and, and then I'll get out of your way so you can get back to your, get to your real meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question, Mr. Adams, Vera Dharma. Oh. Um, yes, Vera. New members are sworn in in January. And I believe most boards are also approving professional contracts in January. But in January, we don't have the, um, financial disclosure statements. So isn't that problematic? You could have new board members voting on contracts where they have a conflict of interest 
and we wouldn't know it because they haven't filed their um, financial disclosure statement. Yeah, that and and I and that could be a problem. My recommendation would be um, uh, typically. Well, uh, let, my recommend there's two two things I would recommend. One, uh, I would recommend we we always recommend to districts that they have what we call an in district new board member orientation, and we we promote that and we recommend that. And our recommendation is that you do that in December. Once the new members are identified and the vote has been certified, you know who your new members are. If you if a district does a new board member, uh, new board member in district orientation, you can bring those folks in. And typically, what you know, what uh, you know, when I've I've been asked about it, I, I the kind of agenda I I recommend is you know the BA, uh, the superintendent discusses you know curriculum and the, you know some of some key points that they want the new members to understand about curriculum and the curriculum process five-year cycles that kind of stuff uh, the BA typically talks about the budget uh, gives a few things about the budget talks about uh, as board secretary talks about the business process the board's business process per the bylaws uh, talks about you know that recommends they understand what the bylaws are, and um, they may there may be so you know they may sometimes ask the attorney to to be a part of that orientation to mention some things. Sometimes I'm asked to be a part of it to talk about ethics, and so during um, and it's it's not the full blown ethics uh, presentation, but I mentioned I talk about conflicts of interest, and I talk about you should be aware of things that potentially if you have a, an interest in a business, etc. So. That, that's a way of prepping your new members in advance so that when they're looking, because they get the agenda and the materials in preparation for the reorg, um, less, you know, minus any confidential stuff, but they'll see the professionals and that stuff. So, the, so hopefully that in, in district orientation gives them a heads up to look for those kind of conflicts in that first meeting. And they may say, I'm going to abstain because I might have a conflict here. So that's a one way. I, if you're not doing an in-district uh, orientation, my recommendation would be at the reorg, once you've gone through reorg, you've got done through the reorg business, and now you're, you know, the election of officers, that stuff, and now you're getting ready to go to the resolutions where you're, you know, approving professionals, et cetera, I would recommend that the attorney, if the attorney is present, if the attorney is not president, pre present, I would recommend either the board secretary or the superintendent uh, talk about just briefly the, uh, the idea of conflicts of interest per the School Ethics Act. If, if you have anything that you might be a conflict on this agenda, we would recommend that you not vote, that you abstain until we get clarification. So, Because I don't know, some districts have their board attorney at reorg, others don't. If the board attorney's there, I would let the board attorney do that kind of heads up, not so that folks don't make a mistake and potentially vote on something that there's a conflict and they didn't realize they shouldn't have voted on. So that's, that's kind of two different ways to potentially handle something like that. Other questions? Well, one thing I, I, I'll, I'll do real quick is as let especially for the new members. I'm your field rep. I, I I'm a field service rep for New Jersey school boards. There's uh, nine of us in the state. We each have a territory. I have Burlington, Mercer, and half of Camden County. That's about 70 boards that I support. I'm your. I'm. We call ourselves the pointy end of the spear. We're we're the first line of defense, so to speak. For for if you've got questions, concerns, uh, you need information, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's my role. That's my that's my job. So if uh, if you have a question, new board member, feel free to, to give me a holler. I get calls every day from board members, superintendents, and business business administrators. So uh, it's it's a normal. But I also will tell you, and for the, especially for the new members, the the veterans have heard this. That is a confidential conversation. You call me. That's a confidential conversation between anyway. you and me. Um, I'm okay. not going to call anybody you on your board to say, to say somebody has spoken to me. 
Um, that's that's a confidential conversation. Anybody you speak to at NJSBA, that's our process. It's confidential. It's a one-way confidentiality. We don't divulge who we speak to, but you're free to, 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 to say, hey, I called Jesse today. I had a question, da, da, da. And at the board meeting, you decide I want to mention this to the full board. You're perfectly free to do that. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But if, if somebody called me and said, hey, you know, did um, you know, Marissa call you today? My answer is no. I can't divulge whether anybody from your board ever called me because that's, that's a one-way confidentiality. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Like I said, you're, most of your members know that already, but as new members, I wanted to mention that to you. And I've taken up enough of your time. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Feel free to give me a holler if you've got other questions. And as I said, the PDF version of the packet of the presentation will we'll get to you uh, later. I'll send it to your BA and she'll get it to you either tonight or tomorrow. So thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your evening and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Jesse. Thank we you, appreciate Jesse. you taking the time to work with us tonight. Thank you. Thank safe. you. Okay, so um, we'll keep this moving so that we can hopefully get to uh, student recognition quickly. Um, approval of minutes of January 6, 2021, reorganization meeting and the January 20th, 2021 special and executive meetings. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, so that was uh, Steve McLaughlin and I'm sorry, who second? I did, Phil. Phil, thank you, Phil. Questions or comments? Okay, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Accept reports of secretary and treasurer for December 2020, which are in agreement. Exhibit C, I make the motion. I Cameron will make the second. Questions or comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Community liaison reports. Is there anybody that would like to? I, I don't think that she's uh, they're here today. Is that correct? I think Cameron, you're going to save what was going to be spoken about for your report. Yes, that's correct. I'll make a mention of it during my uh, liaison report later in the agenda. Perfect. Um, anybody from the Delanco PTO that would like to speak? I'm here, Wendy Flanagan, Secretary Thank PTO. You. Um, hi, our next PTO meeting will be February 16th at 7 p.m. We'll be sending out um, a message with the link to that. Um, we are also going to be holding a PTO rock contest that's kind of like what the Delanco Police Department had done, um, where they hide a rock and when you find it, you get a prize. Um, we had that planned for before the snowstorm. Snowstorm kind of put a wrench in it, but as soon as snow is a little bit tapered off a little bit, uh, we're going to get that out. We will be sending out um, emails about uh, the rock contest as well as um, information with um, some clues about where the rocks are hidden. Um, so far, I, I painted two rocks. We're going to start with two and um, Depending on the interest, then we'll go from there. Um, we also have Spiritware. Um, we have a site that's going to be up and running soon where you can go to our Spiritware site and order directly on the site. Um, I am finding out about whether it's going to be shipped directly to home or not. Um, so we'll have more information for that at the PTO meeting itself. But that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anyone from DISA? Recreation or Township Committee? Yes, hi, this is Fern from Township Committee. Uh, uh, we're working on our budget. Uh, we had a workshop this past Monday evening uh, where the uh, Township uh, Recreation, Fire Department, uh, Emergency Squad, et cetera, uh, the groups came in and gave their presentation. Uh, we have another budget uh, workshop meeting set for Monday, February 22nd at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, so at that point, we should have uh, information from the auditor uh, as far as uh, where we sit financially. 
uh, to be able to go forward with the budget. That's about all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move this along and we will go into the welcome. So hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's meeting for the Delanco School Board. We are going to attempt to go through the material noted on the agenda as quickly as possible. Let me start off by saying that we are all still being impacted by COVID. These are still very difficult times, more so than for some than for others. But I personally want to say how much we all appreciate everything everyone in our town and our school are doing to make each day a little easier for each and every one of us. I am hopeful that we can eventually come to the other side of this sooner than later. Also moving forward, um, if I find, you know, in, in meetings moving forward, if I find that we're dragging on in a specific issue prior to our student recognition, I will table that content to be discussed afterwards. I don't want our students and their parents to have to wait to hear the praise that is due to them. So with that being said, I will now pass the virtual microphone over to our superintendent, Mr. Mercier. All right, thank you, Mrs. Karamanugi, and I appreciate that very much. And you know, um, I actually was gonna say something very similar, that this is student recognition, but I also wanted to take a moment to not only thank our students for being very strong, very patient, and, and as focused as possible uh, over these past 10, 11 months. But um, I, so I wanna thank the students for that, but I also wanna thank their parents for that. Uh, we know that there's a lot of work going on at home with the virtual education and thank our staff for that, our teachers and all other staff members for everything that you as teachers are doing in the school buildings and at home to assist our students and their parents. There's just so much work being done to help our students with the instructional activities and all the academics that we have, all the different programs. So I, I really appreciate the work that everyone is doing uh, so I, so I, I echo what you're saying, Mrs. Cameron, again, absolutely. Thank you. So on to student recognition, we have a number of excellent students listed here when it comes to different aspects of what's happening over the past month. So actually, this student recognition is not technically for February, it's, it's for January. And these students were recommended by their teachers, uh, whether at Walnut or at Pearson. And so um, thank you to the teachers for taking the time to do that. Thank you to the principals, Mrs. Noble and Mr. Conti for uh, collecting that information as well. So let's start with the Walnut Street Middle School students. So uh, first and foremost, for Walnut, we wanted to take a moment to recognize the excellent writers at the school. And last month, uh, because there was a little bit of a glitch, we did leave a student off the list. So I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for your patience and understanding to Ella Van Gendren, a seventh grader who was the writer of the month previously, uh, her name was left off the list. So uh, Ella, congratulations for that. You, you, you actually are a very great writer. And I know this because uh, I was walking through Walnut and I saw a piece that you wrote on the wall near the main office. And I thought it was very touching, uh, very, uh, it was a nice personal narrative. And uh, so I, well done, Ella, you did a nice job with that. We also have another excellent writer that's being recognized, and that is Caitlin Gunteski, an eighth grader. So Caitlin, congratulations to you. And uh, I appreciate all the work you do in writing. I, I didn't see yours up on the wall, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. Um, but thank you, Caitlin. You do, you do an amazing job as a writer. And uh, thank you to the teachers for nominating these students. Uh, let's move on to math. Uh, so our, our fantastic mathematicians over at Walnut are two seventh graders this time around and that is Gianna Teet and Adam Furness. So congratulations to these two students. I'm not going to put you on the spot tonight with any kind of difficult algebra problems, don't worry. So congratulations to you. Uh, artist, so we have a fantastic artist at Walnut and that is Kaylin Walter in sixth grade. Congratulations to Kaylin for that. And I'm sure that we're gonna be seeing your artwork somewhere at Walnut at some point, if it's not already there. Um, most conscientious student is the next honor that we have. And uh, I'm, we have many, many conscientious students. Uh, this student is, is being recognized for being the most conscientious more recently, and that is Cheyenne Barnes. She is an eighth grader. Congratulations to Cheyenne. We have a fantastic scientist that's going to be recognized this month, and that is Morgan Renson, an eighth grade student. And uh, I always have a Soft spot in my heart for science. I talk to Mrs. Harper about that all the time. Uh, my own children love science. So um, Morgan, 
I'm sure you're one of those students that not only is great at science, but you also just love science. So we, we really appreciate that. Uh, we have some amazing athletes on our list. And uh, that's an eighth grader, Derek Smyers, uh, one of our new students this year, actually. Uh, but Derek and I go way back. He was one of my students back when I was a principal in Mansfield. So it, it's been a long time. Derek, congratulations. We also have a seventh grader, Arabelle Petaway. Congratulations to Arabelle for being an amazing athlete. So uh, moving on to music. So we have a, 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 a marvelous musician for this month. That's an eighth grader, and that is Emily Claus. Congratulations to Emily. And as we all know, uh, music, music programs all across the state have been uh, hindered a bit due to COVID-19 because singing and blowing air through a trumpet or, or anything like that uh, isn't really recommended at this time. But, you know, Emily, we appreciate all the fantastic work that you're doing in music regardless of these challenges. Uh, we also have some very dedicated students these students uh, are being recognized by their teachers for just being very focused and very hardworking. Um, and, and they're all sixth graders this time around. So we have Lillian Berger, Yanni Sejas, and Shia Tori. Congratulations to those three students, all sixth graders, uh, showing great dedication. Next, uh, we have perfect participation in ELA, English Language Arts. Uh, this is an interesting one. I don't remember seeing this before, but this is very high praise, uh, perfect, perfect participation in ELA. And that's uh, a seventh grader, Logan Felmy. Congratulations to Logan for that. And a sixth grader, Sarah Taylor. Congratulations to Sarah. And finally for Walnut, uh, we have the Walnut Whiz Kid. And uh, based on my understanding, that student is selected because just, just doing great in many different areas. So that's the Walnut Whiz Kid. And this month, uh, it is a sixth grader. Jason Hubler, congratulations to Jason for being the Walnut Whiz Kid. And so now we will move on to M. Joan Pearson. So for these students, it's a bit different. It's not all categories. It's it's um, students that. Oh, sorry, Jason. <laughs> oh, the host the host muted me by mistake. Understood, Albert. If you're saying I'm talking too much, Albert, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I apologize. All right. So anyway, um, moving on to Pearson. So these students are selected by their homeroom teachers, and uh, it's just for, for for being a great student, conscientious, well-behaved, hardworking, focused on academics. And so um, there's no specific category for these students. They're just doing great overall during our hybrid and virtual learning. Let's start with our kindergartners for Mrs. Arangio and Mrs. Crozier's class, and that would be Kenley McManus and Thomas Lenza. Congratulations to those kindergartners. Uh, next, we'll move on to our first graders from Ms. Smith and Mrs. Weller's class, uh, the, those two homerooms. We have Josie Clark and Salvatore Cameron. Congratulations to our fantastic first graders. Got some second graders coming up next that are in Ms. Lipinski's class and in Mrs. McCann's class. So we have Katie Bartlow and Aaliyah Spence. Congratulations to our second graders. Uh, next for third grade, uh, we have Mrs. Barbara and Mrs. Fitzwater's classes. And for Mrs. Barbara, we have Mariah Bartlow. So um, another Bartlow child is being honored tonight. Congratulations. And for Mrs. Fitzwater, we have Kira Perez. Congratulations to those third graders. Moving on to fourth grade for Mr. Stockton and Ms. Wallace, we have Serjan Gunyadin and Greg Waichi. Congratulations to those two students in, in fourth grade. And by the way, I have a soft spot for fourth grade as well because I taught fourth grade for many years. So fourth graders, uh, awesome job. Next, we have fifth graders coming up and they are Mrs. Brendel and Ms. Letton's class as well as Mrs. Guckin's class. And those fifth graders are Austin Machernik and Julia Ribeiro. Congratulations to those fabulous fifth graders. So uh, once again, congratulations to all of our students uh, at Pearson and at Walnut for being honored this month. You're doing a fantastic job. And again, thank you for being patient, for being strong, for being hardworking and focused during a very challenging time. You know, your parents are probably telling you at home uh, we're talking about it among the staff. 
you know, we're dealing with COVID-19, we're dealing with the difficulties of virtual learning and hybrid learning. Now we have snow that uh, as a child, you know, it looks like fun, but adults typically see, uh, you know, an aching back, uh, slippery road conditions and, and all sorts of other things. So, you know, adults kind of view snow in a different way as, as, a, as a big challenge at times, uh, still fun too. But either way, uh, I appreciate everyone for everything, everything that you're doing uh, during these challenging times. Thank you, Mr. Karmanugian. You're welcome. And thank you everyone for virtually attending. I'm gonna allow all the parents to log off if you choose to do so. You are more than welcome to stay on for the uh, next aspect of the meeting, which is public comment. But um, if you guys are, are done with us tonight, feel free to log off, it's all good. Okay, and I'm just gonna continue moving this along. So we're going to open up um, this for public comment on agenda items. Does anybody have anything to comment on? Okay, if, I, if there's nobody with any questions, that's fine. I will close it at this point in time. And also, and will, um, Mrs. Karmanugian, we, ha we had no comments on the forum oh. as of 4 p.m. today for the online comments. Correct, that's correct. Sorry, thank you about that. Um, and moving along, superintendent's report, Mr. Mersinger. You're on mute. <laughs> thank you, that, that, that's like the phrase of, of 2020 and now 2021, you're on mute. <laughs> you. Yes. <laughs> All right, superintendent's report. Uh, so a motion is requested to approve the following items. Letters A through G. Uh, I have no additional commentary at this time, so uh, a motion is requested. So moved. Anybody to second? It's Phil, I'll second. Okay, questions or comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. She carries. Thank you, Mr. Karmanugan. You're welcome. Action and Program Committee Report, um, CST BOE Update Reclassifications and Placements Confidential Exhibit K. And I'm going to provide a very quick report on the committee meeting that we had just recently, just to get everybody apprised of what was discussed. Um, some important information that probably those of the public would be interested in knowing is that we've given out 350 Chromebooks to students in Delanco. We have 15 uh, hotspots and there's actually still five remaining to give out. So if there's anybody that needs to be educated and needs a hotspot, please reach out to the proper uh, individuals. The glitches that we had experienced early on are becoming less and less common. Um, and our IT, IT team is working really hard and daily to combat any issues a child or parent may have. So um, we also discussed during this meeting attendance. A lot of people are interested in knowing whether or not um, what the attendance is like with our virtual and hybrid programs. And we've held strong in the 90 percentile. Our mark in period one, we have a 97% of attendance. Mark in period, period two was a 91% of attendance. And mark in period three, we've gone back up again to 93%. And when we gave, when these percentages were told to us, it, uh, we asked, you know, why would they vary? What are, you know, different things that we're seeing that is being experienced by whether it be teachers or whomever. And it really is just occasional slips in people signing in more so at the younger levels um, and at the older ones too. Sometimes the kids just log on and forget to sign in to their Google form. And then of course, there's always some fluctuations at the higher levels due to students signing in. And then, you know, they seem to just lose a little bit of interest and kind of just dip out for the day. So those moments of not participating are being counted as attendance infractions. So, um, but everybody is working together to um, get through that and it's working well. So we also, as a board asked, what were the challenges, you know, in this recent time with hybrid and the virtual program. Of course, COVID exposures was probably the, the biggest um, challenge. Um, the weather most recently, and then the availability of staff when you're encountering a, a COVID exposure or this crazy weather. So those were the big three that came up. 
Um, we also discussed some spe special education and we, how we are exploring the ideas of attempting to bring some out of district placements back into the school. So that was an interesting topic. We also discussed attempting to gain interest from the community and from within the school to participate in some new committees that we will feel will provide a positive place to interact and share ideas and promote positivity. The three uh, committees that were discussed were equity and diversity, special education, and academic achievement. So we're looking forward to see how those move forward. We also touched on NJSLA testing. Um, we spoke about how it's mandated by the state as a standardized test. And they were thinking of implementing this between March 15th and June 11th. And we also discussed the concerns related to this because it seems to be a lot of unknowns right now, considering we're in a virtual era. Um, we also touched on professional development. Um, the development is slated to enhance the knowledge within our existing programs, such as school-wide and the math programs. It will also focus on any state mandated, mandated or required training. And lastly, we just discussed briefly some of the miscellaneous curriculum that um, we have at the school. And I shouldn't say it's miscellaneous. This was just something I added at the end. This is our curriculum discussion. And it re, uh, pertained to the math program, ELA, and world languages. And that's the end of my report. And I'm going to keep this moving because um, Mr. Litwack asked if I would read this for him. And Harry, is that still how you would like me to proceed? Yes, please. So I don't have anything in front of me to see. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Thank Not you. a problem. So I'm going to read the finance committee report for Mr. Litwack. Um, I make a motion to approve the following line items. A, necessary line item transfers for December 20th, 2020, Exhibit L. Monthly line account certification for December 2020. Payment of bills in the amount of $740,196.80 per attached bill list, Exhibit M. Submission of a waiver application to the Executive County Superintendent for the Special Education Medicaid Initiative, SEMI, for the 2021-22 school year as the district has fewer than 40 eligible students, Exhibit N. Brown and Brown Benefit Advisors as Health Insurance Broker of Record, Extraordinary Unspecifiable Service per PSCL. F, special education tuition contract for the 2020-2021 school year with Riverside Board of Education for a resource room for one student effective November 16th, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 at an annual rate of $2,952.90 prorated. G, tuition contract for one student to attend a state facility for the 2020-2021 20, school year at the annual rate of 39872 H, special education tuition contract for one student to attend the learning experience preschool program effective January 5th, 2021 through June 30th, 2021 at the annual rate of $6,215 prorated. Tuition contract for the 2020-2021 school year with Riverside Township Board of Education for one student to attend Delanco Township School District Elementary Program effective September 8th, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 at the annual rate of $15,115. J, tuition contract for the 2020-2021 school year with Mount Laurel Tom Township Board of Education for one student to attend Delanco Township School District Elementary Program effective September 8th, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 at the annual rate of $15,115. K, accept the donation of a Dell computer from Dell EMC with an estimated value of $700. L, 2019-2020 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report exhibits O, P, and Q. Excuse me, Marissa. Uh, Mrs. Cameron, again. <laughs> I actually have to go over that part. Okay, so I'll table that until after? Sure. And is that just L in general? Yes. Okay, um, tabling L. Uh, letter M, appointment of Harry Litwack to represent the board in exploring options for feasibility studies and funding for share services with other districts and or re regionalization. N, ratified payment of cafeteria bills in the amount of $9,120.16 with checks 2,194 through 2,195, exhibit S. And O, Nutrisource financial report for the month of December 2020, exhibit T. Okay, so um, I make that motion for all letters except for L. Um, is anybody would like to second? 
This is oh, I have a comment. Is it time for a comment or no? Uh, as soon as um, we have someone second it, I'll okay. open it up for question and comment. What is, okay. what is I'll that? Second, Marissa. Okay. With that I'm sorry? What, what was L? I, 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 I don't have anything in front of me. I can't see it. It's the okay, audit. The, the, final. Yeah, the state audit. What was L that was tabled? What was that about? I, I just have to go over the the um the summary report real quick. Okay. 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 It's just I have nothing in front of me to guide me. Sure. You want me to just go over it before you vote so that you can vote on it? Um no, no, I mean it needs to be tabled, that's fine. Do you want are you going to do give the discussion as to what it's about and then we is that what you want to do? I was going to show the exhibit and then just explain a couple of things and then be okay well, let's do that then okay so we'll hold for questions and comments and the final vote um we'll let vicky discuss uh letter l so that we can vote on the full package here okay so can you see um township of delanco school district government funds no no yes yep Okay. Okay, so this is the um, the summary of the audit report. It's exhibit R in the public packet. Um, the first page in there is not that page. The first <laughs> page is the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point to you a couple items. So the capital reserve account um, is kind of like a savings account for us for capital projects that we'd have to do down the road. That has $432,000 in it, which that's a, a nice amount to have. Um, the excess surplus designated for subsequent years expenditures, 1,169,000 was from the 1819 school year that was used in the 2021 budget. So that's what we were used as revenue to offset taxes in this year's budget. Um, excess surplus in the current, current year being 2019-20, because that was the audit year, um, that was 382,000. That's the equivalent of the 1.1 mil, uh, million. So that's what we're starting next year's budget off with. That's the amount that's going to reduce the taxes. So right there, <laughs> Um, we're starting out at a deficit of $787,000 to start off the budget. Um, the next page is a statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Um, just show you that most of the um, revenues that come into the district are from the local tax levy. That's that first line of $6,139,000. Um, and the other large portion of that is from uh, our state aid. Right, next page. Um, this is the page that shows you if there's any audit findings, but I'm happy to report that there were no findings. So there is no corrective action plan needed. Um, you could get an, an, a finding on any one of these areas and we got a clean report. Um, and I just wanted to thank my staff for doing such a great job because they're very dedicated and that's why we got this great report. That's awesome. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. So I'll, I'll add, add L. L. Ooh, a little bit of reverberation there. Okay. So letter L 2019-2020 comprehensive annual financial report exhibits O, P, and Q presented for acceptance. Summary of the audit report made available to the public exhibit R and no comments or recommendations contain, contained therein. So again, I made the motion. Phil, do you still second or? I'll still second. Okay, questions and comments. Uh, I have one question. This is Phil. The tuition uh, contracts, were they budgeted or? They would be unbudgeted for. Uh, I don't know which ones specifically. Vicki, do you know exactly which letters were budgeted for and which ones were not? Or let's just say which ones were not. Um, so F and H were not. Okay. Thank you. On a happy note, we didn't budget for getting the tuition for I and J, and that's actually funds that are coming into the district. So that's an excellent find. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, ask a question, Vera Darmo. Sure. 
Okay, I have a question on letter E. Brown and Brown Benefit Advisors as health insurance broker of record. Um, I know that we're already in the New Jersey State Health Benefits Program. Um, I'm wondering why we have the health benefits advisor. So that was left that was left off before. Um, but we actually have a vision rider, and they are the benefit um, broker for the vision rider. We already have a vision contract with Horizon. So why? There why is no. There isn't a, a, a vision contract with the state health benefits um, that was equivalent to what they had before when they were with um, AmeriHealth, so we had to switch. Well, I see here vision coverage is provided through Horizon in the August minutes, and the contract was from September 1st, 2020 through December 31st of 2022. So aren't we don't we still have that horizon vision coverage i'd be happy to um if you could send me the information that you have i would be happy to address each individual item but not seeing what you're looking at it's hard for me to tell it's okay i'll just mention it very quickly for the record it's sure. in the august august minutes finance committee report letter d vision coverage provided by horizon september 1st 2020 through December 31st of 2022. Thank you. Also, Brown and Brown, I know in January 2020, uh, they were approved at that time, January 2020. I'm wondering why um, they weren't just on the list in January. Why is it? Is there any reason that we're, we're doing it now and we didn't have them on the list with all the other uh, professional contracts? Yes, because um, you, you and I had discussed this and because I wasn't using them for since we switched to the state health benefits, then I wasn't going to approve them, but then it came to my attention that they still do the vision. And so I put them on now. Double check the vision, right? Mm -hmm. What you're gonna look into the vision since it seems we already have a contract for that? Yeah, she, no, no, no. Yeah. They are the benefit advisor. They got the vision rider for us back back in the summer. I'll have to talk to you after because I I'm still not understanding this. So okay, we'll talk okay. later. Thank you. Okay. 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 Any other questions? I have a question about item C for mm -hmm. the attached bill list. Mm -hmm. um, I just was curious, Vicki, about BioShine. Um, I, I just keep seeing them pop up. So then I was like looking back in different packets and as far back as I could go, which was I think August, we spent $30,000 with them. That's funds that we've budgeted to spend on. That's cleaning. Budgeted. It's mostly supplies, supplies um, custodial supplies, that maintenance supplies that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, because I saw like earlier on, it was mostly like floor wax and general cleaning supplies, but now we've also added COVID cleaning supplies from the same company. And and part of that is coming from the grant funds that we got. Okay. Um, and then, well, that led to me another question, but I, I can ask another question later. Thank you. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I have one question. With, uh, I'm just hoping, well, so yeah, I have a question about uh, M um, or maybe just helping for some clarification. I've heard a little bit about this, but um, so M is uh, appointment of Harry Litwack to represent the board in exploring options for feasibility studies and funding for shared services with other districts and or regionalization. I, I've heard a little bit about that. I have a sense of um, what that involves, but, but I was wondering, uh, Harry, could you just describe a little bit about the rationale for starting that process or what just to, uh, by way of explanation for the public what you're doing? Well, maybe it'd be better if someone from the board other than me explain what I'm doing, because I represent not only the board, but I represent Burlington County and have for the last eight years at the county level and also now at the director's level. So we've been looking at this area that along the river line of small towns that have some of the same unique 
problems. And the, the feasibility study, there's been for the last probably two and a half years at least, the promise of the feasibility study, but there's been no money attached to it yet. So, um, feasibility study for regionalization potentially. Well, right. there are all kinds of things: regionalization, jointures, lo looking maybe long-range planning, uh, working with uh, special services (BCIP) because we pay county taxes and it helps our money go much further away because of the tuition there or developing programs on this side of the county. There's all kinds of things that we've been looking at um, and not just the uh, school boards association, but we've had meetings with Carol Murphy, who's the assembly woman. We've had, um, I've been on for five years on a citizens committee for with Troy Singleton leads. It's um, keeping abreast of what's going on with the politics and what's going on with the changing laws, where, where things are. Are they, on the, are they in the House? Are they in the Senate? Has it been passed by one body? Are they waiting to be passed by another? Are they sitting on the, you know, the governor's desk waiting to be signed? I'll get into that kind of stuff. But the idea is to have the Lenko, depending on how these feasibility studies are funded, be a lead agency, because usually as a lead agency, you get some sort of administrative benefit. And it also would allow us to, you know, have more of a say if we're the ones sort of holding this. But if we don't want to do it in Delanco, Palmyra, you know, there's other towns that maybe want to do it. So that's why I suggested doing it this way, because I don't want to be ethically compromised. Mm -hmm. And when you say administrative benefit, you think there could be some funding attached. Say that again? When you say administrative benefit, you're saying that the state could give us some funding for taking on this role. Well, it's not unusual for whoever the lead educational agency is. Someone has to do the administration yeah. of it. Okay. Right. And if, well, you know, if there is, don't, I think to me, it would make sense for us. I've been standing in line for eight years <laughs> to, when the door opens to be there and doing the legwork and the, the lifting to get us to this point. And I, I would hope we would benefit from it, but if we don't want to, someone in the region will. So someone will pick that up and run with it. And I will have to, you know, be the person helping them as the person that's representing the county. And in this, so that's, and it was mentioned, I don't know, Kat, were you at the, uh, the county meeting on yes. the 4th? Yeah, because I mentioned it there because I wanted to get it on the record at that county level for that very reason. So that's what it's about. It's just trying to, um, if there's a possibility that we can get a feasibility study and whatever, I don't know, it hasn't been formulated yet, but it, in um, it, it, as it turned out, the uh, auditor, he mentioned about uh, someone that he knew is also someone who I know and their former um, commissioners of education. And they're working for a law firm in up in Morristown, New Jersey. And I admit that, and that they're, in other words, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, you know? So if there's a benefit to the Lanco, great. And if there isn't, then we don't, you don't do anything. That's basically how I'm looking at it. Yeah, so Harry brought this up during the budget and finance committee meeting, and we thought it was really important that the full board be aware of something that Harry was interested in exploring. Um, and we feel that it's a great opportunity for him to gain more information and to kind of put Delanco out in the forefront of this endeavor. 
Um, he's going to explore it more in depth to be sure that it's not gonna cost, you know, cost us any money to be involved because that's not something we're looking to do at this point in time. However, the benefits could way outweigh weigh the risks and it's definitely worth exploring. And Harry is the best person to do it. He's been in the trenches waiting for this moment to kind of, you know, get us going in the right direction. And if this can help us in any way possible, then it's a win. So that's why we wanted to put it on the agenda as a line item for transparency purposes so that everybody was aware that he was going to try to look into this um, for our school district. It allows me the freedom to do that. I don't, because Correct. as we've learned in our ethics training tonight earlier, uh, school board members don't act alone. The school board acts together. That's why this is necessary. Yes, so it would be a vote our vote would support him in that endeavor as a board. Yes, that sounds sensible to me. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome, no problem. Any other questions? I just wanna thank Harry for being forward thinking and trying to get us on the right track. So thanks, Harry. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? To letter E and the others I vote aye. Awesome, thank you. Anybody abstain? Okay, motion carries. Um, operations and facility committee report, Mr. Caliguire. This is Karen Manuvi. This is uh, Vince Caliguire. I cannot read the report at this time. I was not sent exhibit you. Could you read it off if possible, please? Um, Joe, do you happen to have that in front of you? Because I do not have that one. <laughs> You're on mute. I'm sorry, I usually send that to him and I didn't do that today. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Joe, you're on mute. Uh, it's oh, okay. It's in the packet, right? So we'll, uh, I looked I'll in the packet. I didn't... Yeah. Yeah, I only printed out so much. Now, <laughs> I mean, the packet, it's, it's actually difficult to search certain PDFs, but if you put in the word operations, let's see, maintenance, Typically a maintenance report. I tried that with all the financial. I was it was. Yeah, it's, it I'm going through all the financial pieces right now. <laughs> oh, I know. All right, I'll, I'll I'll find it eventually in the packet. Let's see here. <laughs> there there are 46 mentions of the word maintenance. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so then what we'll yeah, do that's... is that we'll move on to personnel, and then hopefully you find. It's in the it's in the confidential packet on page seventeen. Just so you know. Hey, thank you, oh, Catherine. Late. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. All right, so um, Vince, do you have that in front of you, the confidential packet? I'll be honest, I got too much on my screen right now. Could you read it off, please? Sure. Yeah, operations and facilities committee report. Uh, this is for the month of January, twenty twenty one. Routine maintenance activities uh, since the schools are in hybrid session uh, due to coronavirus. Uh, the, the maintenance team is is working in the schools to ensure that everything is cleaned and sanitized. We do have students in the building at times. We have staff in the building at times. Uh, snow removal, obviously, they uh, the facilities team's been working on that. Thank you to Tim and his team. And then all um, completions of all other work orders, uh, general maintenance that they receive. Uh, special projects, uh, Tim Allen says that they're working on uh, the LED lights at Walnut. Um, the district already had them from the Pearson lighting project, so they installed those. The hood range was tested, inspected, and cleaned at Pearson. They installed new soap dispensers at Walnut. Uh, they replaced the combustion fan motor on RTU3, uh, fixed a big roof leak at Pearson in the, main, in the main entrance hallway, and all class ventilators were cleaned and checked to make sure they're working properly. Uh, so those are special projects that Tim and his team were working on. Transportation, no activities at this time. And then the next uh, committee meeting for this will be March 1st. That completes the report. And thanks again, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I was searching the public one and then, uh, you know, I was going to move on to the confidential, but. <laughs> okay. Policy committee report, Ms. Darmo. Yes, um, we were looking over Strauss ESME policy alerts dated September 2020. Um, some of the changes were just a few uh, minor changes, but there were some 
brand new policies, for example, the something on electronic funds transfers. And we felt that we needed to research that a little more. Also, um, Steve McLaughlin um, presented some ideas for uh, having better communication with the public. Specifically, we brought up um, um, policy uh, with board member communication with the public. Um, item number six, board members are not to respond to any posting regarding the Board of Education and school district business. Um, in that language, it doesn't specify that if you are acting as a private citizen, it's okay. I mean, the language, we're looking at the language and what we can do to facilitate more communication between the public and the board. And uh, Mr. Mersinger brought up something very important, which that all school districts basically, or almost all have their school policies online. Anybody, any member of the public can go to any district, look at what their policies are regarding any issue, say uh, social media, school board member communication, compare it to Delanco, get ideas, generate ideas that way. And uh, that's basically what we talked about. Thank you. Personnel committee report, Mr. C. Jenkins. Thank you, Mrs. Karamanugi, and I will make the motion to approve the following. A, the updated substitute list as attached. B, the appointment of Donna Healy to the position of part-time, three out of five days, long-term substitute for English as a second language, with a start date of March 1st, 21, and an end date of June 30th, 21, pending required background checks to be paid at the board-approved rate for substitute teachers. Uh, C, the retirement of... Nancy Fox, secretary to the superintendent after 25 years of service to the district, effective January 1, 2022. D, the hourly rate increase to $12 per hour due to the increase in minimum wage for Stacy Loveland, effective January 1st, 21. Uh, and E and F, also hourly rate increases to $12 per hour due to the increase in minimum wage for Araceli Haig and Jennifer Niva, both also effective on January 1st, 21. I will make the motion. I'll second it. Thank you. Questions and comments? Mr. Darmo has a comment on the part-time ESL teacher. It's three out of five days a week. Who will be servicing the ESL students the other two days? The program operates under a three out of five day schedule. Uh, that that's historically been the case that it's a part time role. So okay. That, yes. So state regulation, they do not need to be seen a minimum number of minutes per day. That's my understanding of the ESL teacher. Okay. I mean, I, we can certainly discuss this at another time. I I, I would rather. I would prefer not to discuss or debate uh, the, the hours and minutes required for each ESL student at the time. I hope with that we're fulfilling our legal requirements. That's the only reason why I'm asking this. Okay, thank you. Okay, roll call vote, please. Mr. Caliguire. Yes. Ms. Darmo. Uh, everything yes except for B. I need to look into that more. Letter B is no for me. Mr. Dovey. Yes. Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Yes. Mr. Phil Jenkins. Yes. Mrs. Cameron Ugian. Yes. Mr. Litwack. Yes. Mr. McLaughlin. Yes. Mrs. Tersich Keeley. Yes, with a note that I, I would prefer to have an update from Mr. Mersinger that we are meeting the requirements for ESL education at future meetings. Uh, just, just so the board is aware, what we're currently doing in ESL is three out of five days per week. That's been the case for a number of years. So this is not a change to the ESL schedule at all. Um, but what I can say is each student requires a different number of hours and or minutes. It's not a blanket requirement. So, so you know, when it when it comes to that, it's it's very hard for me to say, well, yes, absolutely, we've done everything we can. But what I can say in, in general, though, that the students are receiving what they need 
uh, for ESL services. But when it comes to compliance in ESL, uh, each student, there's a different level of compliance for. So, I mean, I, I would say yes to that, absolutely. But I, um, but I also want to state for the board that, and the board is aware of this, that we actually have not had an actual ESL teacher for a, a, a very long time. The county is aware of this. Uh, we have had a substitute in the role. And so that, that part, I mean, if we want, that's why talking about compliance, uh, we're supposed to have an ESL teacher, but uh, the, the current situation is that we haven't been able to fill that role with an ESL teacher. So their needs are being met by a substitute. Uh, so it, it is questionable whether that's 100% compliant uh, but that's why the county, you know, I've, I've talked to the county about this and uh, I don't know that they can officially endorse it, but I think they understand that we don't really have any other options. How many students are in our ESL program, Joe? I was in the 20s the last time I checked, so I, I would have to bring up that data. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's good enough. It's that it's more than a couple, more than a handful of kids. Well, uh, um, so when I first arrived in 2014, I believe we had about five students in ESL. Yeah, that's... At that point, it was a different program. It has evolved yeah. over time uh, when it comes to, you know, what we're providing now for, for ESL. It's, um, you know, it, it, it is a different program from when I first arrived. And I would say it's a better program, but again, we're, we are, we're still experiencing that challenge of, of, you know, being able to fill that role or not with a certified ESL teacher. Uh, so looking up the data, we have 19 at this point. We, it was in the 20s uh, the last time I looked, but it's now 19. Thank you. Uh, it might be worth thinking about expanding that to a full-time position in the future. Is you know, it, it sounds like 20 students sounds like quite a, a lot for one, one teacher to accommodate. Yeah, State testing, the state testing um, on par with the NJSLA called the access test for ESL, that has to be given by a certified ESL teacher. So I know we're out of compliance there. So I don't know if that causes QSAC points or... We, Absolutely. You know? I mean, the, the, like I said, the county is aware of this, that, you know, when it comes to compliance, we are, uh, you know, partly compliant compliant and partly not. And that's, you know, like I said, I, I would rather not discuss and debate this topic because new board members, but over the years, this topic has become very convoluted for us, for our district, um, for different reasons. But no matter it's also what, a personnel, um, you know, personnel but, issue, isn't it? Isn't yeah. it also a personnel issue that we should be in executive session if we're talking? Well, I mean, if we talk about individual student needs, of course, I, you know, that oh, because we, if we voted on, I guess the person's already on board. If we voted her, the person that we're talking about, that's three fifth is a real person, not a number. It is. I mean, if we were, if we were to talk about staff, prospective staff, uh, you know, anything related to staffing, you know, it would be an executive or, you know, student topics really this in general. But, you know, in general, ESL has been a very convoluted topic over the years uh, because of compliance concerns, uh, you know, when it comes to having a certified person. How many, and, and the number of days, you know, is sufficient according to what we have and, and the student needs. However, Stephen, you're absolutely right that there could be a time where we need a full-time person in that role based on the needs of the students. There's a twofold. This is the, uh, excuse me, but this is some of the reason why we're looking into regionalization because one district needs three fifths. Oh, next door, they need two fifths. Well, why don't we get a full time person and have it coordinated somehow? There's different ways to solve problems. I see this as basically a step in the right direction that we have a certified or soon to be certified teacher for ESL, that's the precision is getting better, not worse. And the, the, the way that it is handled is the way that Joe is handling it. You report it to the county, they know you're not in compliance and they say, okay, we know you're not in compliance. And hey, if anybody thinks it's a good idea at this point, 
to hire a full-time person, play, pay full-time benefits for a three-fifths position, maybe that's what we should do, unless the other two-fifths can be used some, somehow else that we need. That's my take on it. Okay. So that motion carries from the roll call vote. And so we're before move we on. move on, on Mrs. Cameron again, I just wanted to make a comment about Nancy Fox, who we see her retirement is listed there. Uh, just to just so everyone's aware, Nancy is a wonderful person. She's done a fantastic job as a secretary, and she is not retiring immediately, as you can see. It's it's going to be effective uh, close to a year from now. Uh, but Nancy has been a fixture in the district for many years. Um, she is loved by all. And, uh, you know, I've already told Nancy, we are going to miss her. Uh, but thankfully, you know, we still have her for about another year. Yeah, awesome. she's great. She's great. She's always just yes. an upbeat in the door when you walk in the door, which has been a long time, for over a year, I guess. <laughs> but it's nice, you know, it was funny. I was thinking about her, wondering how she was doing in her family and kids, grandkids. That's awesome. Congratulations on your future retirement, but we're happy to still have you for a little bit longer. <laughs> um, that motion carried. Um, board liaison reports, Riverside School District, Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Uh, last month, Riverside had their reorganization meeting the day after hours on January 7th. I was unable to attend as I was out of state at the time, but uh, the main thing of note that occurred, I lost I lost it. Yeah. Nope. I got it. Was, um, where did it go? We have a notice of resignation of the, uh, Riverside superintendent, um, Mrs. Robin Eric. So I feel that was of note to mention here. She will be missed. I, I believe her effective date is July 1st, 2021. And, uh, here I will also report the uh, Riverside High School Student Council report. Um, they are currently in the middle of Spirit Week. All students are encouraged to participate. Remote students can submit pictures to us. In January, we focused on our daily social media post on social emotional health of the students, a big thing during these tumultuous times of COVID. Also in January, we submitted our applications to top 10 projects and the Community Smile through NJASC. And we are attending weekly meetings with the NJASC to continue to develop our leadership skills and share I our ideas with other schools. That is all I have, Madam President. Thank you, Karen. NJSBA and BCSBA, Mr. Litwack. Thank you. Um, and I, I was glad that for the first time in the eight years I've been on the board that Kat, we had someone else who was at one of the county meetings. and. I would be interested before I read of just Kat's impression of what was going on and of the meeting. I was with you two years ago, Harry. <laughs> I was on the fourth. I was on the fourth that this meeting took place. Just over, just impressions, Kat, if there's any. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, uh, so I, just to be honest with you, my daughter also was crying in the middle of the night, so I had to get up and leave a couple of times. <laughs> but so, so it was nice that it was a virtual meeting. It was, uh, there was a lot of attendees. Um, it was super professional, which I thought was um, I mean, yeah. not, not any different than mm -hmm. our meetings, but um, it was just like very, they were very on top of their things. I liked the, there was a part uh, towards the end about the mascot branding, which I thought was fun. There are yeah. some schools who have yeah. to rebrand because of, um, let's say like inappropriate mascots that have come through in the past. Um, but yeah, it was, it was educational. It, it was, it was a, on the longer side, but um, definitely still some good nuggets in there. And I actually asked for a recording of it after, which I have, if anybody cares to watch it, who did not get to attend. So. Great. Great. And, and that anybody on our board, they're, you know, invited to those at any time. And they're, they're, you know, before COVID, it, they were at, um, you know, you get a meal out of it too. That's how they got people there. <laughs> and I think what Kat saw is the, and all of us seeing Jesse, uh, the professionalism that the school board association 
delivers. So there were 43 participants from out the, throughout the county. And that's what it was about, about branding. And it's, it sounded as if that Lenape district is going to have to look at changing the name. I always thought if they were um, holding up the different Native Americans in homage, not in any kind of detriment, but it's the, uh, if they're the warriors or the chiefs, that's what the problem comes in. So anyway, um, there's a special report that's out that hopefully people have seen, eyes on the future about mental health and how it's impacting physiologically impacts and mental health and the overwhelming need that there is for both uh, students and staff as well, and probably all of us at some point. Uh, the, there's a STEAM tank, which is STEM and STEAM that the board, and they're even hooked up with the military with that. Um, we had Jesse's meeting uh, that was, and we did the census uptake. Thank you, Vicki. Um, and the Senate, here's what's going on. They're, because of the mental health issues, they're thinking of issuing on student IDs, on the back of it, a suicide hotline number so that every kid would have right there on their, it feels strange <laughs> in an odd way, but I, I, you know, people prefer that you can access help when you need it. And uh, it, that needs a house vote on it in New Jersey. There's a bill sitting on the governor's desk for 2021 that includes some of the same topics we've been talking about, diversity, inclusion, K to 12, gender, sexual, and uh, disabilities and religious provisions, and that we all have unconscious bias. So that was, that was at that meeting. And then the director's meeting, uh, once again, the emphasis is on the student health and, and learning during COVID, um, the special education issues, uh, stakeholders being addressed, uh, <clears throat> a re examination of, for post pandemic, boys, you know, that there's going to be a point in time when we're past this and leaving. Uh, that there's a learning policy institute that um, led into, because of some of the issues that are going on statewide uh, about the, um, what we talked about in ethics and right, about virtual communication, et cetera, that they're going to have to, it looks like they're passing some law to clarify that uh, so that it will be a point where everyone understands what you can and can't do and that you do give up some of your First Amendment rights when you're on a school board. Um, Jonathan Pushman, who does uh, legal throughout the state for the School Boards Association, and um, basically it looks like it's going to be flat funding again for this year. Uh, February 23rd, the governor, you know, it'll, it'll be in happening, whatever, and the, whatever the budget priorities happen to be. And chapter 44, some of the unintended consequences of that, which I think may be the key what led to the vision that like an unintended consequence as that was changed over our district, that's how it was affected but there were 580 other districts who might've been affected differently. And then um, this Monday, there was Jonathan Bush, who is both a school board member, has been a president, I believe, uh, somewhere along the Jersey Shore, from, and he's Bush Law Group, but he's in a lot of different counties. And he spoke about vaccination and this is gonna come up. This is some stuff that we haven't, that we're gonna to have to address. The vaccination, the school district staff, you know, and they, they gave the, and it was a total opinion, as he stated. This is my opinion. 
and not to force people to get vaccinated to return to school. And the possibility of having clinics for teachers, hospital systems, systems delivering that. I already heard Pennsylvania, they're already doing that. You know what is gonna be a problem? Is that anti-vaxxers, remember that was a hot topic, anti back, you know, the anti-vaxxers. And this is all going to just come up again with the COVID vaccination, whether we realize it or not. So we need to be aware of that. And the, the um, they're looking at different things about constitutionally, uh, do they have to fund schools that keep unvaccinated students and teachers out? There are some issues that are going to come up. And we're, we're probably going to uh, maybe deal with them sooner than larger districts. And remember, education is a state rights matter. Uh, it's never mentioned in the Constitution, education. So we all have to stay safe, healthy, get vaccinated if you can, when you can, and be healthy. And if you're an anti-vaxxer or don't want to get it, I guess you don't get it. But everyone's going to be wearing masks for a while. So that's all I got to say from the county and state level. Okay, thank you, Harry. Township Committee, Ms. Tarshitz Keeley. Um, so there were three meetings since we last met as a Board of Education. Um, the first one was on 111, and that one um, I attended along with Vicki, Joseph, and Marissa. And Vicki presented our preliminary budget to the committee, requested they review options for providing additional funding to the schools. Um, which has become more and more important with the influx of additional students from local construction projects. Um, there was a meeting on February 1st where they adopted, I mean, several things happened, but one big one of note was that they adopted an or ordinance authorizing the constructions of various capital improvements in and around the township of Delanco, um, appropriating a total sum of $440,000, uh, 240,000 of which comes from the road aid grant. Um, and then on 2-8, which was the most recent one, they uh, basically had a small budget workshop sort of thing where each group or committee that gets money from the town came um, and talked about uh, the budget that they were presenting and, and the amount of money that they were requesting. The library board did a really nice presentation of all the activities they've been offering online and for the community during 2020. Um, DISA uh, talked a little bit about um, some of the, the struggles they're having right now in particular about basketball because the according to them the school has discontinued the practice of letting outside groups use the facilities um, during covid and so they were uncertain about the use of the building in the future um, and they were having some trouble making plans for what was going to be happening um, recreation also referenced the use of the school building in regards to the summer camp um, they were hoping to meet at the end of the month to gauge um, interest and start planning for their summer camp. And their intention is to have it, um, but obviously COVID will affect that decision. Um, and they mentioned that they also need to find out from the school whether or not they would let outside groups use the facilities. Um, Kate Fitzpatrick responded to both of them by saying that um, she was going to investigate the referendum around uh, the, uh, I guess, like the gym building usage, um, whether it's how it falls into um, uh, use for the purposes of the residents of Delanco or not. So I'm not sure if the school will be hearing from her or not. Um, but uh, the only other update was that the township committee, which actually Fern updated us on earlier, they're going to be looking at their incoming revenue and its impact um, on their budget at the next meeting on February 22nd at 3.30 p.m. So we hopefully will have updates after that. Great. Thank you so much. So, so I, Catherine, I do have a question about that. That's interesting. The, the, comments about the gym usage and whatnot. I, I wasn't aware of that yet, but I did. Um, I received your report. Um, did you want me to send that to the board? I could email it to everyone now so they have all the details. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, and I thought I hit send on that to you guys before the meeting, but I did not. <laughs> so, all oh, good. Guess. Hey, you know, I, I, um, I'll just forward the, the message directly. No, no edits from me or anything. But mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes to uh, this topic of the gym usage. I mean, I know that there might be some questions out there, but because of COVID-19, uh, you know, the school certainly reserves the right to decide, you know, what we're doing with that. Now, as part of our reopening plan, you know, it's still kind of on hold, but uh, eventually things 
sorry, eventually things are going to start opening back up again in some way or another. Um, but having outside uh, athletics or other activities right now is just, uh, it's a difficult topic. It doesn't, doesn't mean it, it's an automatic no for every aspect of, of what people want to do, but it, it's, it's a no for now, you know, so it, it's, it will be uh, continue, you know, we'll continue to discuss it and explore it uh, in coming months. Okay. Uh, old business, uh, 2021 to 2022 budget update. Uh, ethics forms must be signed and returned to the business administrator. If you where do we get so, those? Do so. where, where do we get those? It, one was actually sent I had out. emailed them before, and Mr. Mersinger sent them out today again. Okay, I'll, I'll get it yes. then on the, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, board member mandatory training for 2021. Board member NJSBA training on March 10th, 2021 at 6 p.m. So that'll be our next training. New business, all board members and school officials will receive an email regarding the filing and the filing of the annual ethics disclosure statements, which should be available the week of February 8th. Deadline for submission by new board members, like Jesse had mentioned, is March 24th, 2021. The deadline for all other existing members is April 30th, 2021. As of today, that still was not available. Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, are all, I assume all distributions have been sent out. I now I'm going to open this up for public comment or non agenda items. Um, I see Eric mess up has his hand up. Let me see. I think I can unmute him. Hey, hi, Eric. Hi, how you doing, Marissa? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. All right. Um, I have a couple comments that I, I would like to kind of go over. Um, so I'll just know them if you like. Uh, number one, I, I'd like to know kind of the logic behind the chosen instructional model. Uh, I've, I've noticed uh, uh, at a couple of my at-home days that the hybrid students on their remote learning days, so Walnut, I should say, hybrid students on their remote learning days have a good amount of downtime um, and are kind of expected to work asynchronously. And I was wondering if a synchronous model would be a little bit more beneficial and allow teachers uh, to kind of accomplish more on their pacing guides versus the current model. And I don't know if that's something that you can answer to superintendent. And then I, I, I can wait for my second question or uh, have that this first one addressed now. It's up to you. I can, I can say that I, I believe our teachers are doing a fantastic job. I believe our principals have developed schedules that are excellent. And um, when it comes to the instructional model, uh, it is being constantly in, revised and improved. So if we look back at the spring, uh, we look back at the fall, we look at now, I feel like our teachers and our, and our school principals have continually improved the model that's in place. Now, what I can say for everyone, uh, we will be planning for marking period four soon. And um, yes, I mean, we do have it on our minds to continually revise and improve for marking period four. Uh, that does not mean that we might, that we would necessarily have any massive sweeping changes, but uh, we are looking to continually improve this because the ultimate goal during this entire situation is to ensure that the students are being educated uh, to the highest and, and greatest extent possible. So when we look at this overall situation, you know, it, it, what's safe for everyone, students and staff and everyone in the building um, has to be the top priority right now. But, but at the same time, uh, we're in the business of education. So, you know, I, I appreciate this comment or question uh, and I, uh, as a fellow educator, and when it comes to this topic, just, just I want the community to, to know and the board and everyone to know that my team and I, including every teacher in this district, uh, we are continually improving what we're doing uh, for the virtual instruction and the plan that's coming up for marking period four. Uh, it, it will, um, my goal is for it to have a few changes that show even additional improvements upon what we're doing. So that, that's the response I can give for now uh, for, for the sake of the board and, and for the public. 
Now, Joe, to, to, to piggyback off of that and also piggyback off of uh, what Harry said earlier about uh, mental health, what, what does the district do to, to monitor students, um, say, it, while they're at home or while they're logged in to either, you know, school district provided Chromebooks and or like into their school Google accounts? Um, you know, for example, um, you know, that there was a recent news story about other school districts that uh, were, were monitoring what uh, students were typing in the Google and things like that. So, uh, you know, as we kind of look at what the district provides for students uh, as far as mental health, are we really monitoring kind of what they, they type in? For example, if a student logged into a school district provided Chromebook types in something about, um, you know, God forbid, a, a suicidal type situation. Does the school district get notified of something like that at this point? All right. Well, um, you know, in, it, Mr. Massa, Eric, you know, we're fellow educators. Uh, we were just told by Jesse Adams that this is not meant to be a dialogue or a discussion with the public. It's meant to be public. understood. I was there. I, I was a little late to this one today. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm not saying that I wouldn't answer your question. Uh, but I, what I do want to say is that, you know, I, I don't want this to be just an ongoing dialogue between, you know, two guys that know about the education field. Uh, but what I will say for, for the sake of the board and the public is that ment student mental health is absolutely so important for us. Uh, we have two counselors. Uh, they do a fantastic job working with our students. When it comes to monitoring students, though, um, our technology, uh, if they're using district-owned devices, uh, we, we do have situations in, in which, um, you know, we, we are able to, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, because when it comes to cybersecurity, that, that is a confidential topic. Right. But let's just I can this way. We have that discussion separately with yeah. you, you know, yeah, but, and that's fine. Um, yeah, cybersecurity is confidential. If we, if yeah. I start revealing all the different tactics that we and strategies we use that that help with cybersecurity, I think that that opens us up. But the point is that uh, we are absolutely very mindful of student mental health, especially now. Uh, I mean, the, with the way things are happening in the world, whether it comes to uh, issues going back to June or May and June with with uh, the death of George Floyd and the impact that that had on our society and culture and on emotions uh, for students and, and everyone. And then you look at the COVID-19 situation, uh, we're very mindful of that as well because, uh, you know, for, for some of us, you know, we've been fortunate that it doesn't have that direct impact, uh, but for others, uh, th there, are, there are people dying from the virus, you know, so this is a real thing. Uh, so that absolutely we're mindful of that. So, uh, you know, I mean, we are, we are absolutely taking steps and our staff members are very mindful of it. And then, it, then my final question, which is kind of separate, um, but it was coming off of something that I believe I heard at the last uh, board meeting where, and, and I'm kind of looking for confirmation here, and I know I can't get direct answers particularly on this. Um, it, so it's kind of like a, a point and a comment afterwards. Um, but if it is true, uh, what was said at the last meeting about former Board of Education members serving um, on negotiation committees instead of current ones. I, I just kind of want to put on the record that I'm kind of strongly opposed to that choice because negotiations, as you know, can be a very long and sensitive process. We've seen this one, um, you know, because of COVID draw out a little bit and, and not being able to, to get certain, uh, you know, things moving because of that. But, um, you know, former board members are, are members of the public no different than, than really any other audience member here. And, and Optics matter, and the, the optics of that one. I, my personal opinion would be that they're, they're not exactly, um, you know, positive in a sense, right? But um, you know, it, it, I just kind of wanted to make that particular point. And I know you can't really comment on that because of negotiations. Well, I can comment on the person because I chose Stephen for that position, and I'm not going to discuss negotiations in general. I'm just going to dis discuss the fact that I made that decision. Um, and I promise you the decision was not made lightly and it is back legally, we've made sure of that. I based my decision off of the need for continuity moving forward. We had lost two existing members this deep into the negotiations and that could be detrimental to our forward progression to a positive resolution. Um, Steven's successful performance as a negotiations committee member in the past, um, in addition to his financial background has proven meaningful in past discussions and lastly, he just has great historical knowledge 
that enables him to fully understand where and why we need to act. And these attributes and many more are why Steve, I chose Stephen for this position and why I feel that by choosing him to help us, we will get to a, a fair place in this process. I appreciate that response, Marissa. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other um, comments on non-agenda items? No, I yield to the rest of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have a comment, Mrs. Okay, Kamenugin. Uh, just so, yes. so everybody who's here, uh, so you're aware, you know, there is snow that's going to be coming down tonight. And uh, everybody's probably wondering what's going to happen with school tomorrow. Uh, there will be a determination tomorrow morning, uh, not this evening. So uh, parents expect a phone call, text, email at some point in the morning if there is any change to the schedule. And if not, if there is no change at all, uh, you know, we would just proceed with business as usual. So we'll have to see. Uh, every time a, a snow event happens, my colleagues and I meet sometimes at four, like tomorrow it's going to be 4.45 a.m. So uh, my colleagues and I meet, we talk about the pros and cons. Some districts go one way, some districts go another way. It really depends on the situation. But just be aware that typically uh, we're, we're very well aligned with uh, Riverside. Uh, that's not always the case. It's not 100% of the time, but typically we're aligned with them. So thank you. All right, thank you. If there are no other comments, I will close the public comment section. Is there a need to go into executive session? I don't remember there being anything to be discussed, but I just wanted to put it out there. Fabulous news. Okay, so then the last aspect of this is a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And all in favor? We're seconded. Uh, uh, Steve. Steve. No, Steven. Steven. Thank yeah. you. Was Steven, Steven or Mr. Dover? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Time to adjourn. Good meeting. I appreciate your time, everyone. Have a good night, guys. Good night. Good night Thank you. Everyone. Be safe. Thank you.